Hello, I'm Micah, and welcome to Micah Reads. Hello, and welcome back to Micah Reads. Upon request, I am going to be reading a book. It has to be done by, like, early September, so I will do my best to get through it. No guarantees. It's actually a really long book. So... I gotta tell you what that book is. It's Life of Pi. Life of Pi by Jan Martel. I remembered the name of an author for once in my life. Now you know. So, this book, uh, somebody requested, has to be done by September 15th. No one has requested anything specific with a specific deadline, so I'm going to start with this. I haven't been recording videos for... Watch my other videos explaining why I haven't been doing uh, other readings, but I'm doing this one. So, without further ado, what are we at? 38 seconds without actually starting. 39, 40, 42... I'm going to start reading, okay? Chapter 1. <clears throat> My suffering left me sad and gloomy. Academic study and steady, mindful practice of religion slowly brought me back to life. I have kept up with what some people would consider my strange religious practices. After one year of high school, I attended the University of Toronto and took a double major bachelor's degree. My majors were religious studies and zoology. My fourth year thesis for religious studies concerned certain aspects of Cosmogony Theory by Isaac Luria, the great 16th century Kabbalist from Safed. My zoology thesis was Functional Analysis of the Thyroid Gland of the Three-Toed Sloth. I chose the sloth because its demeanor, calm, quiet, and introspective, did something to soothe my shattered self. There are two-toed sloths and there are three-toed sloths, the case being determined by the forepaws of the mammals, since all sloths have three claws on their hind paw. I had the great luck one summer of studying the three-toed sloth in situ in the equatorial jungles of Brazil. It's a highly intriguing creature. Its only real habit is indolence. It sleeps or rests on average 20 hours a day. Our team tested the sleep habits of five wild three-toed sloths by placing on their heads in the early afternoon after they'd fallen asleep bright red plastic dishes filled with water. We found them still in place late the next morning, the water of the dishes swarming with insects. The sloth is at its busiest at sunset, including the word busy here in the most relaxed sense. It moves along the bow in a tree in a characteristic upside-down position at the speed of roughly 400 meters per hour. On the ground, it crawls next to its tree at the rate of 250 meters an hour. When motivated, which is... 440 times slower than a motivated cheetah, unmotivated, it covers 4 to 5 meters in an hour. The three-toed sloth is not well informed about the outside world. On a scale of 2 to 10, where 2 represents unusual dullness and 10 extreme acuity, Beeb, 1926, gave a sloth's sense of taste, touch, sight, and hearing a rating of 2, and its sense of smell a rating of 3. You come upon a sleeping three-toed sloth in the wild, Two or three nudges could suffice to waken it. It would then look sleepily in every direction but yours. Why should it look about its uncertain, since the sloth sees everything in a magoo-like blur? As for hearing, the sloth is not so much deaf as uninterested in sound. Beeb reported that fir fire firing guns next to sleeping or feeding sloths elicited little reaction, and the sloth's slightly better sense of smell should not be overestimated. They are said to be able to sniff and avoid decaying branches, but Bullocks, 1968, reported that sloths fall to the ground clinging to decayed branches often, often in quotations. How does it survive, you might ask? Precisely by being so slow. Sleepiness and slothfulness keep it out of harm's way, away from the notice of jaguars, ocelots, harpy eagles, and anacondas. The sloth's hairs shelter an algae that is brown during the dry season and green during the wet season. So the animal blends in with the surroundings of moss and foliage and looks like a nest of white ants or of squirrels or like nothing at all but part of a tree. The three-toed sloth lives in a peaceful vegetarian life in perfect harmony with its environment. A good-natured smile is forever on its lips, reported Turler, 1966. I have seen that smile with my own eyes. I am not one given to projecting human traits and emotions onto animals many a time during that month in Brazil, looking up at a sloth in repose. I find it was easier the presence of upside-down yogis deep in meditation or hermits deep in prayer, wise beings whose intense, imaginative lives were beyond the reach of my scientific probing. Sometimes I got my majors mixed up. A number of my fellow religious studies students, muddled agnostics who didn't know which way was up, were one of thrall of a reason, 
What that fool's gold for the bright reminded me of the three-toed sloth, and the three-toed sloth, such a beautiful example of the miracle of life, reminded me of God. I never had problems with my fellow scientists. Scientists are a friendly, atheistic, hard-working, beer-drinking lot whose minds are preoccupied with sex, chess, and baseball when they're not preoccupied with science. I was a very good student, if I may so say, say so myself. I was tops at St. Micah's College for four years in a row. I got every possible student award from the Department of Zoology. If I'd gotten none from the Department of Religious Studies, it's simply because there are no student awards in this department. The rewards of religious study are not in mortal hands. We all know that. I would have received the Governor's General Academic Medal at the University of Toronto's highest undergraduate award, of which no small number of illustrious Canadians have been recipients, were it not for the beef-eating pink boy with neck like a tree trunk and the temperament of an unbearable good cheer. I still smart a little at the slight. When you're suffered a great deal in life, an additional pain is both unbearable and trifling. My life is like a memento mori painting from the European art. There's always a grinning skull at my side to remind me of the folly of human ambition. I mock this skull. I look at it and say, You got the wrong fellow. You may not believe in life, but I don't believe in death. Move on. A skull snickers and moves ever closer. Well, that doesn't surprise me. The reason death sticks so closely to life isn't biologically necessity. It's envy. Life is so beautiful that death has fallen in love with it, a jealous, possessive love that grabs at it what it can. But life leaps over oblivion lightly, losing only a thing or two of no importance, and gloom is but the passing shadow of a cloud. The pink boy also got the nod from the Rhodes Scholarship Committee. I love him, and I hope his time at Oxford was a rich experience. If Lakshmi, goddess of wealth, one day favors me bountifully, Oxford is fifth on the list of cities I would like to visit before I pass on, after Mecca, Varanasi, Jerusalem, and Paris. I have nothing to say of my working life, only that a tie is a noose, and I inverted, I inverted through it is. I will hang a man nonetheless if he is not careful. It will hang a man nonetheless if I am not careful. I love Canada. I miss the heat of India, the food, the house lizards on the walls, the musicals on the silver screen, the cows wandering the streets, the crows cawing, even the talk of cricket matches, but I love Canada. It is a great country, much too cold for good sense, inhabited by compassionate, intelligent people with bad hairdos. Anyway, I have nothing to go home to in, on Dick Cherry. On to Cherry. Richard Parker has stayed with me. I have never forgotten him. Dare I say I miss him? I do. I miss him. I see him in my dreams. There are nightmares, mostly, but nightmares tinged with love. Such is the strangeness of the human heart. I still cannot understand how he could abandon me so unceremoniously, without any sort of goodbye, without looking back even once. That pain is like an axe that chops at my heart. The doctors and nurses in the hospital in Mexico were incredibly kind to me, and the patients, too. Victims of cancer or car accidents, once they heard my story, they hobbled and wheeled over to see me. They and their families, through none of them, spoke English, and I spoke no Spanish. They smiled at me, shook my hand, patted me on the head, left gifts of food and clothing on my bed. They moved me so uncontrollable fits of laughing and crying. Within a couple of days, I could stand, even make two, three steps, despite nausea, dizziness, and general weakness. Blood tests revealed that I was anemic, and that my level of sodium was very high and my potassium low. My body retained fluids, and my legs swelled up tremendously. I looked as if I had been grafted with a pair of elephant legs. My urine was deep, dark yellow going on to brown. After a week or so, I could walk just about normally, and I could wear shoes if I didn't lace them up. My skin healed, though I still have scars on my shoulders and back. The first time I took a tap on, its noisy, wasteful, superabundant gush was such shock that I became incoherent my legs collapsed beneath me, and I fainted in the arms of the nurse. Oh, turned a tap on, as in turned on the faucet. Okay. The first time I went into an Indian restaurant in Canada, I used my fingers. The waiter looked at me critically and said, Fresh off the boat, are you? I blanched. My fingers, which is a second before I had taste buds savoring a food a little ahead of my mouth, became dirty under his gaze. They froze like criminals caught in the act. I didn't dare lick them. I wiped them guiltily on my napkin. He had no idea how deeply these words wounded me. They were like nails being driven into my flesh. I picked up the knife and fork. I had hardly ever used such instruments. My hands trembled. My sunbar lost its taste. And that's the end of chapter one. So, if you haven't seen the movie Life of Pi, I will not spoil it for you. But just a heads up, uh, the cover of this book has a tiger on a boat. Uh, so, 
And a guy on that... Sorry, I didn't mean to hit the microphone. There's a guy on that boat with the tiger, so I think we can assume what's going on here. He was shipwrecked in some way, and he was trapped on a boat with a tiger, and his pee's, like, super yellow because he's probably drank some salt water, and, like, his body's kind of messed up. So what we're doing is we're building up a story. We know how his how his life has evolved past this, how he's now studies religion and zoology, and... I'm reason sloths. He seems super about this. There's a lot more to this story, I can obviously tell. Um, so he's really into the whole religious thing after his experience, which we learn at the very end of this chapter has something to do with him waking up in a Mexican hospital, and then from the cover we can determine where he was. Uh, so that's that. I'm not going to spoil any of this book for you. I've never read it before. Uh, and we're just going to roll on through this. I thought I saw a picture just for a second there. Okay, I'm not going to waste your time. All right, so thank you so much for joining me. It was cool to hang out, and I will catch you guys in the next chapter. Bye. What a win. And I will win. Oh, yeah. Hello, I'm Micah, and welcome to Micah Reads. Hello, and welcome back to Micah Reads. I'm Micah, obviously, and we're going to be reading Life of Pi by Jan Martel. And this book is about a tiger in a way, I assume, based on the cover of this book and the movie that I saw, and I will not spoil anything. Like I said in the last last chapter. If you need a like summary of the last chapter, I did a brief summary at the very end of a previous one, and we can just hop right into this, right? Yeah, because we're on chapter two. Yeah. Oh, and uh, apologies, I guess, for the, the background here. Uh, just moved into a new place, uh, trying to figure out a good camera microphone setup. This is not the final setup. This is awful video quality. I can, I know, I know that it's blown out because the light is behind me, not in front of me, so you can barely see my face. There's green... It's a bad setup. I will get a better setup. Not right now. Eventually, I'll have a better setup. So right now, you're just going to... I want this out. <laughs> I haven't read a book in a while. All right, so, chapter two. <clears throat> he lives in Scarborough. He's a small, slim man, no more than five foot five. Dark hair, dark eyes. Hair graying at the temples. Can't be older than 40. Pleasing, coffee-colored com colored complexion. Mild fall weather, yet puts a big winter... Parka with fur-lined hoods for the walk to the diner. Expressive face, speaks quickly, hands flitting about. No small talk. He launches forth. And that was the end of chapter two. This is going to be chapter two and three. I'm not just going to leave you with that half a paragraph of that chapter. All right, chapter three. I was named after a swimming pool. Quite peculiar, considering my parents never took to water. One of my father's earliest business contacts was Francis Adarumbasi. He became a good friend of the family. I called him Mamaji. Mama being the Tamil word for uncle and Ji being a suffix in India used to indicate respect and affection. When he was a young man long before I was born, Mamaji was a champion competitive swimmer, the champion of all South India. He, lo he looked the part, the part his whole life. My brother, Ravi, once told me that Mamaji was born, he didn't want to give up something, give up on breathing water, and so the doctor, to save his life, had to take him by the feet and swing him above his head, round and round. It did the trick, said Robbie, wildly spinning his hand above his head. He coughed out water and started breathing air, but it forced all his flesh and blood into his upper body. That's why his chest is so thick and his legs are so skinny. I believed him. Robbie was a merciless teaser. The first time he called Mamaji Mr. Fish to my face, I left a banana peel on his bed. Even in his sixties, when he was a little stooped in a lifetime of counter obstetric gravity, he began to nudge his flesh downwards. Mamaji swam 30 lengths every morning in the pool of Aurobindo Ashram. Sorry, I'm not great at reading Indian words, but I will get there. I'm 100% on top of this. He tried to teach my parents to swim, but he never got them to go beyond wading up to their knees at the beach and making ludicrous round motions with their arms, which, if they were practicing the breaststroke, made them look as if they were walking through a jungle, spreading the tall grass ahead of them. Or, if it was the front crawl, as if they were running down a hill and flailing their arms so as not to fall. Ravi was just as un unenthusiastic. 
Amaji had to wait until I came into the picture to find a willing disciple. The day I came of swimming age, which, to my mother's distress, Mamaji claimed was seven, he brought me down to the beach, spread his arms seaward, and said, This is my gift to you. And then he nearly drowned you, claimed my mother. I remained faithful to my aquatic guru. After his watchful eye, I lay on the beach and fluttered my legs and scratched away at the sand with my hands, turning my head at every other stroke to breathe. I must have looked like a child throwing a peculiar slow-motion tantrum. In the water, as he held me at the surface, I tried my best to swim. It was more difficult than on land, but Maji was patient and encouraging. When he felt that I had progressed sufficiently, we turned our backs on the laughing and shouting and the running and the splashing, the blue-green waves and the bubbly surf, and headed for the proper rectangularity and the formal flatness and the paying admission of the ashram swimming pool. I went there with him three times a week throughout my childhood, a Monday, Wednesday, Friday early morning ritual with the clockwork regularity of good front crawl stroke. I have vivid memories of this dignified old man stripping down to nakedness next to me, his body slowly emerging as he neatly disposed of each item of clothing, decency being salvaged at the very end by a slight turning away in a magnificent pair of athletic bathing trunks. He stood straight as he was ready. He had epic simplicity. Swimming instruction, which in time became swimming practice, was grueling, but there was a deep pleasure in doing a stroke with increasing ease and speed over and over, till hypnosis practically, the water turning from molten lead to liquid light. It was on my own a guilty pleasure that I returned to the sea, beckoned out the mighty waves that crashed and reached for me in humble tidal ripples, gentle lassos that caught their willing Indian boy. My gift to Mamaji one birthday, I must have been thirteen or so, was two full lengths of credible butterfly. I finished so I spent I, I finished so spent I hardly had to wave at him. Beyond the activity of swimming, there was a the talk of it. It was the talk that father loved. The more vigorously he resisted actually swimming, the more he fancied it. Swim lore was his vacation talk from the workday talk of the running a zoo. Water without a hippop- hippopotamus was so much more manageable than water with one. Mamaji studied in Paris for two years, thanks to the colonial admission. He had the time of his life. This was the early 1930s, when the French were still trying to make Potichere as Gaelic as the British were trying to make the rest of India Brit- Britannic. I don't recall exactly what Mamaji studied, something commercial, I suppose. He was a great storyteller, but forgot about his studies, or the Eiffel Tower, or the Louvre, or the cafes of the Champs-Élysées. All his stories had to do with swimming pools and swimming competitions. For example, there is a Piscine d'Illigny, the city's oldest pool, dating back to 1796, an open-air barge moored on the Quai d'Orsay, and the venue for the swimming events of the 1900 Olympics. But none of these times were recognized by the International Swimming Federation because the pool was six meters too long. The water in the pool came straight from the Seine, unfiltered and unheated. It was cold and dirty, said Mamaji. The water, having crossed all of Paris, came in foul enough. Then the people made it utterly disgusting. In conspirational whispers with shocking details to back up his claim, he assured us that the French had very low standards of personal hygiene. The ligny was bad enough. Bain Royale, another latrine on the Seine, was worse. At least in Deligny, they scooped out the dead fish. Nevertheless, an Olympic pool is an Olympic pool, touched by immortal glory. Though it was a cesspool, Maji spoke of Deligny with a fond smile. One was better off than the Piscine Chateau Landon, Landon Rouvet, or Du Boulevard de la Guerre. There were import, indoor pools with roofs on land and open year around. Their water was supplied by condensation from steam engines from nearby factories, and so, and so was cleaner and warmer. But these pools were still a bit dingy and tended to be crowded. There was so much gob and split floating in the water, I thought I was swimming through jellyfish. Ugh, chuckled Momaji. The Piscines Hebert and Luger Roland and Boot a Cali were bright, modern, spacious pools fed by artesian wells. They set the standards for excellence in municipal swimming pools. There was the Piscine du Tourelles, of course the city's other Olympic pool, inaugurated during the second Paris Games of 1924. And there were still others, many of them. But no swimming pool in Maji's eyes matched the glory of the Piscine Molitor. It was the crowning aquatic glory of Paris, indeed of the entire civilized world. 
It was a pool the gods would have delighted to swim in. Moltier had the best competitive swimming club in Paris. There were two pools, an indoor and outdoor. Both were big as small oceans. The indoor pool always had two lanes reserved for swimmers who wanted to do lengths. The water was so clean and clear, you could have used it to make morning coffee. Wooden changing cabins, blue and white, surrounded the pool on two floors. You could look down and see everyone and everything. The porters who marked your cabin doors with chalk to show it was occupied were limping old men, friendly in an ill-tempered way. No amount of shouting and tomfoolery ever ruffled them. The showers gushed hot, soothing water. There was a steam room and an exercise room. The outside pool became a skating rink in winter. There was a bar, a cafeteria, a large sunning deck, even two small benches with real sand. Every bit of tile, brass, and wood gleamed. It was... It was... It was the only pool that made Mamaji fall silent, his memory making too many lengths to mat- mention. Mamaji remembered Father Dreamed. That is how I got my name when I entered the world, a last welcome addition to my family three years after Ravi. Piscine Molitor Patel. And that is the end of chapter three. Thank you so much for joining me. I'll catch you in the next chapter. Um, Actually, let's back it up. I got to do a little summary there. So this guy's name, or the main character, his name is... Has seen Molitor Patel, Patel being a very common last name in India. Uh, and he goes through discussing Mamaji, his um, basically swimming instructor from when he was younger. And his swimming instructor, he called Mamaji, the name breaks down into basically uncle, but then respectfully uncle. And uh, the guy was an Olympic swimmer at one point. And he goes uh, back recalling all the best pools throughout France, and I couldn't pronounce any of them, and I guess maybe some in India, but again, it was, the small details don't matter, even in the slightest. You can skip this whole chapter if you want to. Um, basically, it was just introducing how he was taught and how he was named all swimming centric, which is helpful because we already know what this book is about, him being stuck on the ocean. So swimming is probably somewhat critical to the story. Okay. Thank you so much for joining me, guys. I'll catch you in the next video. Chapter. Goodbye. What a win. And I will win. Oh, yeah. I will win. Hello, I'm Micah, and welcome to Micah Reads. Hello and welcome back to Micah Reads. Once again, I'm Micah, and we're going to be reading Chapter 4 of Life of Pi. There we go. I keep trying to say To Kill a Mockingbird. That was a long time ago, and it got copyright taken down. Real sad. Uh, anyway, it's Chapter 4, right? Yeah, Chapter 4. <clears throat> Our good old nation was just seven years old as a republic, but it became bigger by a small territory. Pondicherry entered the Union of India on November 1st, 1954. One civic achievement called for another. A portion of the grounds of Pondicherry Botanical Garden was made available rent-free for an exciting business opportunity, and lo and behold, India had a brand new zoo, designed and run according to the most modern biologically sound principles. It was a huge zoo, spread over number, new, yeah, numberless acres, big enough to require a train to explore it, although it seemed to get smaller as I grew older, train included. Now, it's so small it fits in my head. You must imagine a hot and humid place, bathed in sunshine and bright colors. The riot of flowers is incessant. There are trees, shrubs, climbing plants, and profusion. Peoples, gulmores, (laughs) flames of the forest, red silk cottons, jacarandas, mangoes, jackfruits, and many others that would remain unknown to you if it didn't have neat labels at their feet. There are benches. On these benches, you see men sleeping, stretched out, or couples, young couples, who still glances at each other shyly, and whose hands flutter in the air, happening to touch. Suddenly, amidst the tall and slim trees up ahead, you notice two giraffes quietly observing you. The sight is not the last of your surprises. The next moment, you are startled by a furious outburst coming from a great troop of monkeys, only outdone in volume by the shrill cries of strange birds. You come to a turnstile. You distractedly pay a small sum of money. You move on. You see a low wall. What can you expect beyond a low wall? 
Certainly not a shallow pit with two mighty Indian rhinoceroses, but that's what you find. And when you turn your head, you see an elephant that was there all along, so big you didn't notice it. In a pond, you realize there are hot hippopotamuses floating in the water. The more you look, the more you see. You are in Zoo Town. Before moving to Pondicherry, Father had a rather large hotel in Madras. An abiding interest in animals led him into the zoo business. A natural transition, you might think, from hot keeping to zoo keeping. Not so. In many ways, running a zoo is a hotel keep's worst nightmare. Consider the guests never leave their rooms. They expect not only lodging, but full board. They receive a small, constant flow of visitors, some whom are noisy and unruly. One has to wait until they saunter into their balconies, so to speak, before one can clean their rooms. And then one has to wait until they tire of the view and return to their rooms before one can clean their balconies. And there's much cleaning to do, for the guests are unhygienic as alcoholics. Each guest is particular about his or her diet, constantly complains about their slowness of their service, and never, ever tips. To speak frankly, many are sexual deviants, either terribly repressed and subject to explosions of frenzied, frenzied <sighs> lasciviousness, or openly depraved, in either case, regularly affronting management with gross outages of free sex and incest. Are these the sorts of guests you want to welcome into your inn? The Pondicherry Zoo is the source of some pleasure and many headaches for Mr. Santosh Patel, founder, owner, director, head of staff of 53 and my father. To me, it was paradise on earth. I have nothing but the fondest memories of growing up in a zoo. I lived in the life of a prince. What a ma Maharaja's son had such vast, luxurious grounds to play about. What palace had such mangerie? My alarm clock during my childhood was a pride of lions. There were no Swiss clocks, but the lions could be counted upon to roar their heads off between 5.30 and 6 every morning. Breakfast was punctuated by the shrieks and cries of howler monkeys, ill mi minas, and Moluccan cockatoos. I left for school under an elephant benevolent gaze, not only of mother, but also bright-eyed otters and burly American bison, stretching and yawning orangutans. I looked up as I ran under some trees, otherwise yeah, peafowl might excrete on me. Better to go by the trees and shelter the large colonies of fruit bats, and only assaulted there as the early hour was the bats' discordant concert of squeaking and chattering. On my way, on my way out, I might stop by the terraria to look at the shiny frogs glaze bright, bright green, or yellow and deep blue, or brown and pale green. Or it might be birds that caught my attention, pink flamingos or black swans or one waddled cassowaries, or something smaller, silver diamond doves, cape glossy starlings, peach-faced lovebirds, nande cunures, orange-fronted parakeets. Not likely that the elephants, the seals, the big cats, or the bears would be up and doing, but the baboons and macaques, and the mangabays and gibbons, the deer, the tap tapirs, the llamas and the giraffes, and the mongooses were early risers. Every morning before I was out the main gate, I had one last impression that was both ordinary and unforgettable. A pyramid of turtles. The iridescent snout of a mandrill. The stately silence of a giraffe. The obese yellow open mouth of a hippo. And the beak and claw climbing of a macaw parrot. Up a wire fence. The greeting claps of a shoebill's bill. The senile lecherous expression of a camel. And all these riches were had quickly as I hurried to school. It was after school that I discovered in a leisurely way what it's like to have an elephant search your clothes in the friendly hope of finding a hidden nut or orangutan pick through your hair for tick, tick snacks. It's a wheeze of disappointment at what an empty pantry your head is. I wish I could convey the perfection of a seal slipping into the water or a spider monkey swinging from a point to the point or a lion merely turning its head. But language founders on such seas. Better to picture it in your head if you want to feel it. In zoos, as in nature, the best times to visit are sunrise and sunset. That is when most animals come to life. They stir and leave their shelters and tiptoe the water's edge. They show their raiments. They sing their songs. They turn to each other and perform their rites. The reward for watching eye and the listening ear is great. I spend more hours than I can count, quiet witness to the highly mannered, manifold expressions of life that grace our planet. It is something so bright, loud, weird and delicate as to stupefy the senses. I have heard nearly as much nonsense about zoos as I have about God and religion. Well-meaning but misinformed people think animals are the wild and happy because they are free. 
These people unusually have large, handsome predator in mind, a lion or a cheetah. The life of a gnu or aardvark is rarely exalted. They imagine this wild animal roaming about the savannah on digestive walks after eating a prey that has accepted its long piously or going for calisthenic runs to stay slim after un overindulging. They imagine this animal overseeing its offspring proudly and tenderly, the whole family watching the setting of the sun from the limbs of the trees with sighs of pleasure. The life of the wild animal is simple, noble, meaningful, they imagine. Then, it is captured by the wicked men and thrown in tiny jails. Its happiness is dashed. It yearns mightily for freedom. And it does all it can to escape. Being denied its freedom for too long, the animal becomes a shadow of itself, its spirit broken. So some people imagine. This is not the way it is. Animals in the wild lead lives of compulsion and necessity within an unforgiving social hierarchy, in an environment where the supply of fear is high and the supply of food low. And when the territory must constantly be defended and parasites forever endured, what is the meaning of freedom in such context? Animals in the wild are in practice free neither in space nor in time, nor in their personal relations. In theory, that is, a s simple physical possibility, an animal could pick up and go, flaunting all the social com conventions and boundaries proper to its species. But such an event is less likely to happen than for a member of our own species, say a shopkeeper with all the usual ties to family, friends, to society, drop everything and walk away from his life, with only the spare change in his pockets and the clothes on his frame. If a man, boldest and most intelligent of creatures, won't wander from place to place, a stranger to all, beholden to none, why would an animal, which is by temperament far more conservative? For that is what animals are, conservative. One might even say reactionary. The smallest changes can upset them. They want things to be just so, day after day, month after month. Surprises are highly disagreeable to them. You see this in their spatial relations. An animal inhabits its space, whether in a zoo or the wild, in the same way chess pieces move across a chessboard, significantly. There is no more happenstance, no more freedom involved in the whereabouts of a lizard or a bear or a deer than the location of a knight on a chessboard. Both speak of patterns and purpose. In the wild, animals stick to the same paths for the same pressing reasons season after season. In a zoo, if an animal is not in its normal place, in regular posture and usual hour, it means, not, it means something. It may be the reflection of nothing more than a minor change in the environment. A coiled hose left by a keeper has made the men menacing impression. A puddle is formed that bothers the animal. A ladder is making a shadow. But it can mean something more. At its worst, it could be that the dreaded thing to a zoo director, a symptom, a herald of trouble to come, a reason to inspect the dung, to cross-examine the keeper, or summon the vet, all this because a stork is not standing where it usually stands. But let me pursue for a moment only one aspect of the question. If you went to a home, kicked down the front door, chased the people who live there out in the street, and said, Yo, you are free, free as a bird, go, go. You think they would shout and dance for joy? They wouldn't. Birds are not free. People who've just evicted would sputter, With what right do you throw us out? This is our home, we own it. We have lived here for years. We're calling the police, you scoundrel. Don't we say, There is no place like home? That's certainly what animals feel. Animals are territorial. That is the key in our minds. Only a familiar territory will allow them to fulfill the two relentless imperatives of the wild, the avoidance of enemies and the getting of food and water. A biologically sound zoo enclosure, whether cage, pit, moated island, coral terrarium, aviary, or aquarium, is just another ter territory, peculiar only in its size and proximity to human territory. It is so much smaller than it would be in nature, stands to reason. Territories in the wild are not as large not as a matter of taste, but of necessity. In a zoo, we do for animals what we have done for ourselves with houses. We bring together in a small space what the wild is spread out. Whereas for us, the cave was here, the river over there, the hunting grounds a mile away, the lookout next to it, the berries somewhere else, all of them infested with lions, snakes, ants, leeches, and poison ivy. Now the river flows through taps at a hand's reach, and we can wash next to where we sleep. We can eat where we have cooked, and we can surround the hole with a protective wall and keep it clean and warm. A house is compressed territory, where our basic needs can be fulfilled close by and, by sa close by and safely. A sound zoo enclosure is the equivalent for an animal, with a noteworthy absence of a fireplace or the like present in every human habitation. 
finding within all the places it needs, a lookout, a place for resting, for eating and drinking, for bathing, for grooming, etc., and finding that there is no need to go hunting, food appearing six days a week, an animal will take possession of its zoo space in the same way it would lay claim to a new space in the wild, exploring it and marking it out in the normal ways of its species, with praise of urine, sprays of urine, perhaps. Once its moving in ritual is done and the animal is settled, it will not feel like a nervous tenant, and even less like a prisoner. But rather than landholder, and it will be behave in the same way with its enclosure that it would in the territory in the wild, including defending its tooth defending it tooth and nail should be should it be invaded such an enclosure is subjectively neither better nor worse for an animal than its condition in the wild so long as it so long as it fulfills the animal's needs a territory natural or constructed simply is without judgment a given like the spots on a leopard one might even argue that if an animal could choose with intelligence it would opt for living in a zoo since the major difference between the zoo and the wild is the absence of parasites and enemies the abundance of food and in the first in the respect of abundance and scarcity in the second. Think about it yourself. Would you rather be put up with a Ritz with a free room service and unlimited access to a doctor, or be homeless without a soul to care for you? But animals are incapable of such discernment. Within the limits of their nature, they make do with what they have. A good zoo is a place of carefully worked out coincidence. Exactly where an animal says to us, stay out, with its urine, or other secretion, we say to it, stay in, with our barriers. Under such conditions of diplomatic peace, all animals are content and we can relax and have a look at each other. In the literature can be found legions of examples of animals that could escape but did not, or did and returned. There is a case of the chimpanzee whose cage door was left unlocked and had swung open. Increasingly anxious, the chimp began to shriek and slam the door shut repeatedly with a deafening clang each time. So the keeper, notified by a visitor, hurried over to remedy the situation. A herd of roe deer in European zoo stepped out of their corral when the gate was left open. Frightened by visitors, the deer bolted for a nearby forest, which had, had its own herd of wild roe deer, and could support more. Nonetheless, the zoo roe deer quickly returned to their corral. Another zoo, a worker was walking towards his work site in an early hour, carrying planks of wood, when, to his horror, a bear emerged from the morning mist, heading straight for him at a confident pace. The man dropped his planks and ran for his life. A zoo staff immediately started searching for the escaped bear. They found it back in its enclosure, having climbed down into the, its pit the way it had climbed out, by way of a tree that had fallen over. It was the thought that the noise of the planks of falling wood to the ground had frightened it. But I don't insist. I don't mean to defend zoos. Close them all down if you want, and let us hope that wild, what wildlife remains can survive in what's left of the natural world. I know, I know zoos are no longer in people's good graces. Religion faces the same problem. Certain illusions about freedom plague them both. The Pondicherry Zoo doesn't exist anymore. Its pits are filled in, the cages torn down. I explore it now only in the place left for it. My memory. And that is the end of chapter four. All done. Look at that. It was a longer chapter, and I'm assuming the chapters will get longer and longer, or just alternate size like every other book. But there are like 95 chapters in this book, so buckle down. There's a lot of videos to come. So what happened in this chapter was, there was a description of um, this guy's childhood. So I don't remember his name, I'll get there, I mean we have a lot to go. Um, so what his childhood was about was he lived in a zoo, his family, he, uh, his dad actually, he owned a hotel. And he got out of the hotel business to open a zoo because there was a new area opened up to India uh, via territory that they claimed. And so they opened a zoo in this area in a botanical garden, and that's where he lived and grew up, the main character. And he talks about how zoos actually aren't this horrible thing, uh, keeping animals in, caged up as prisoners. It's more of a, like an enclosed territory in which they're provided all of the things that they would normally have in the wild, but without risk of, you know, dying by parasites or predators or anything like that. So animals are actually quite content with their smaller territories and their examples of which... When they have, like, a way to escape, they, like, maybe walk out, but they're like, ah, I don't like it, I want to be back where I'm comfortable, because their home is their territory, and really it doesn't matter what the size is, as long as they are comfortable and all of their needs are met, because they're very reactionary creatures, they don't really care about freedom, they just care about not dying, and being able to, like, you know, live in a good social environment that's conducive to the animal itself. And basically, it was just a description of the environment that this kid grew up in, in this cool zoo. But then he also says that the zoo's gone now. There's no more zoo. It only exists now in his memory. And yeah, 
That's that. Thank you so much for joining me, guys. I appreciate you dropping in. I'll catch you in the next chapter. Bye. What a win. And I will win. Oh, yeah. Welcome back, I'm Michael Reeds, and we're going to be reading Chapter 5 of Life of Pi by Jan Martell. Again, I remember the actual name of the author for once. And you'll notice that the setup is slightly better. Um, I actually put a light here, which is good. It's the same light I was using before. It's the, you know, it's the same light. It's really... Looking at myself is making me self-conscious about my appearance. Anyways... So this book, ready? Yeah? Ready? Okay, cool. I'm actually going to be reading multiple chapters this time, I think. Three of them? Yeah, you'll see that in the description. Cool. My name isn't the end of this story about my name. When your name is Bob, no one asked you, how do you spell that? Not with the Piscine Molitor Patel. Some thought it was P. Singh, and that I was a Sikh, and they wondered why I wasn't wearing a turban. In my university days, I visited Montreal once with some friends. It fell to me to order pizza one night. I couldn't bear to have yet another French speaker guffawing at my name. So when the man on the phone asked, Can I have your name? I said, I am who I am. Half an hour later, two pizzas arrived for Ian Houlihan. <laughs> it's true that those we can meet can change us, sometimes so profoundly that we are not the same afterwards, even unto our names. Witness Simon, who is called Peter, Matthew, also known as Levi, Nathaniel, who is Bartholomew, Judas, not Iscariot, who took the name Thaddeus, Simeon, who went by Niger, Saul, who became Paul. My Roman soldiers stood in the schoolyard one morning when I was twelve. I had just arrived. He saw me, and at a flash of evil genius lit upon his dull mind. He raised his arm, pointed at me, and shouted, "'It's Pissing Patel!' In a second, everyone was laughing. It fell away as we filed into the class. I walked in, wearing my crown of thorns. The cruelty of children comes as news to no one. The words would waft across the yard to my ears, unprovoked, uncalled for. Where's pissing? I've got to go. Or, you're facing the wall. Are you pissing? Or something of the sort. I would freeze, or the contrary, pursue my, ac pursue my activity, pretending not to have heard. The sound would disappear, but the hurt would linger like the smell of piss long after it had evaporated. Teachers started doing it too. It was the heat. As the day wore on, the geography lesson, which in the morning had been compact as an oasis, started to stretch out like the Thar Desert. The history lesson, so alive when the day was young, became patched and dusty. The mathematics lesson, so precise at first, became muddled. In their afternoon fatigue, as they wiped their foreheads and the backs of their necks with their handkerchiefs, Without meaning to offend or get a laugh, even, teachers forgot a fresh aquatic promise of my name and distorted it in a shameful way. By nearly imperceptible modulations, I could hear the change. It was as if their tongues were charioteers driving wild horses. They could manage well enough the first syllable, the P, but eventually the heat was too much and they lost control of their frothy mouthed steeds and could no longer rein them in for the climb to the second syllable, the scene. Instead, they plunged hell-bent into sing, and the next time round all was lost. My hand would be up to give an answer, and I would be acknowledged with, Yes, pissing. Often the teacher wouldn't realize what he had just called me. He would just look at me wearily after a moment, wondering why I wasn't coming out with the answer. And sometimes the class, as beaten down as the heat was, couldn't, wouldn't react either, not a snicker or a smile. But I always heard the slur. I spent my last year at St. Joseph's School, feeling like the persecuted Prophet Muhammad in Mecca. Peace be upon him. But just as he planned his flight to Medina, the Hajira, that would mark the beginning of Muslim time, I planned my escape to the beginning of a new time for me. After St. Joseph's, I went to Petit Cementier, the best private English medium secondary school in Pondicherry. Ravi was already there, and like all younger brothers, I would suffer following in the footsteps of a popular older sibling. He was the athlete of the generation at Petit Seminaire, the fearsome bowler and the powerful batter, the captain of the town's best cricket team, our very own Kapil Dev. That, 
I was a, uh, that I, I was a swimmer made no waves. It seemed to be the law of human nature to choose those who live by the sea are suspicious of swimmers, just as those who live in the mountains are suspicious of mountain climbers. But following in someone's shadow wasn't my escape. Though I would have taken the name over pissing, even Robbie's brother, I had a better plan than that. Oh, I would have taken pissing over Robbie's brother. I had a plan better than that. I put into execution on my first day of school, in my very first class, around me, the other alumni of St. Joseph. The class started the way all the way, all the news classes start, the stating of names. We called them out from our desks in order which we were happened to be seating. Oh boy. Ganapathy Kumar said Ganapathy Kumar. Vipin Nath said Vipin Nath. Shamshul Huda said Shamshul Huda. Peter Darmaj said Peter Darmaj. Oh boy. I'm martyring these. Each name elicited a tick on the list of brief mnemonic stare from the teacher. I was terribly nervous. Ajith Gadeson said Ajith Gadeson, four, th four deaths away. Sampath Saroja said Sampath Saroja, three away. Stanley Kumar said Stanley Kumar, two away. Sylvester Naveen said Sylvester Naveen, right in front of me. It was my turn. Time to put down Satan. Medina, here I come. I got up from my desk and hurried to the blackboard before the teacher could say a word. I picked up a piece of chalk and said as I wrote, My name is Piscine Molitor Patel. Known to all as, I double underlined the first two letters of my given name. Pi Patel. For good measure, I added, the pi symbol is equal to 3.14. And I drew a large circle, which I then sliced in two with a diameter to invoke the basic lesson of geometry. There was silence. The teacher was staring at the board. I was holding my breath, then he said, Very well, Pi, sit down. Next time you will ask permission before leaving your desk. Yes, sir. He took my name off and looked at the next boy. Mansour Ahmed, said Mansour Ahmed. I was saved. Gwitham Selvaraj, said Gwitham Selvaraj. I could breathe. Arun Annaji, said Arun Annaji. A new beginning. I repeated the stunt with every teacher. Repetition is important in the training, not only of animals, but also of humans. Between one commonly named boy and the next, I rushed forward and emblazoned, sometimes with a terrible screech, the details of my birth. It got to the, got to be that after a few times the boys sang along with me, a crescendo that climaxed after a quick intake of air while I underlined the proper note, with such a rousing rendition of my new name that it would have been a delight of any choir master. A few boys followed up with the whispered urgent, 3.14 as I wrote it as fast as I could, and I ended the concert by slicing a circle with such vul vigor that bits of chalk went flying. When I put up my hand that day, which I did every chance I had, teachers greeted me, with, granted me the right to speak with a single syllable that was music to my ears. Students followed suit. Even St. Joseph's devils. In fact, the name had caught on. Truly, we are a nation of aspiring engineers. Shortly after, there was a boy named um Prakash, who was calling himself Omega, and another who was passing himself off as Epsilon. And for a while, there was Gamma, and Lambda, and Delta, but I was the first and the most enduring of the Greeks at the Petit Seminaire. Even my brother, the captain of the cricket team, the local god, approved. He took me aside the next week. What's this I hear about a nickname you have, he said. I kept silent, because whatever mocking was to come, it was to come. There was no avoiding it. I didn't realize you liked the color yellow so much. Color yellow? I looked around. No one must hear what he was about to say, especially not one of his lackeys. Ravi, what do you mean? I whispered. It's all right with me, brother. Anything's better than pissing, even lemon pie. As he sauntered away, he smiled and said, You look a bit red in the face, but he held his peace. And so, in the Greek letter that looks like a shack with corrugated tin roof in the elusive, irrational number... And with which scientists try to understand the universe, I found refuge. And that's the end of chapter five. So just a brief, um, I will still be doing multiple chapters this one. I'll just give you a brief description real quick of what happened in this chapter. So in this chapter, basically, uh, he was, he doesn't like his name at all because it sounds kind of like pissing, uh, when you do read it out. And I guess that's how it bothered him. Let's see, his name was Piscine. P-I-S-C-I-N-E, but a lot of people called him pissing, so he got really pissed off, and when he finally went, ha, pissed off. Uh, eventually, he got to a new school, as we often reinvent ourselves when we go to a new school. I know I definitely did. Um, 
he goes to this private school and immediately when it comes to like the name call when like everybody says their name so the teacher knows how to pronounce it he instead of just saying his name walks up to the chalkboard and in every single class he writes on the chalkboard his name and underlines the first two letters and says you're gonna call me pi pi like the symbol pi that represents 3.1415 not he only did 3.14 but from that point on, everybody was like, oh, that's that's cool. You go by Pi. And it's just like, after being insulted and like heckled for so long in his life, it was just like the most accepted thing. No one even knew that he went by, that people like insulted him calling him pissing. It was just completely new life that he invented. And so, yeah, that was it. He reinvented his name, basically called himself Pi. And his brother came around to tease him um, because... He was really wor- like Pi was really worried that his brother would say something, and then the whole school would start calling him pissing, just like the old school did. And his brother's like, "I didn't know you liked the color yellow so much." And he's like, "Oh God, he's gonna say pissing." But then instead, he says like lemon pie, and it was like the stupidest joke. But like, I mean, lemon pie is yellow, like piss. He was just trying to throw him off. Anyways, so his brother's gonna keep it a secret, and he's just gonna go by Pi. And cool, that's it, that was the whole point of that chapter maybe I spent as much time as the chapter did trying to explain that, anyways, moving on chapter 6, which is really short, it's like half page he's an excellent cook his overheated house is always smelling of something delicious his spice rack looks like an apothecary shop, when he opens his refrigerator or his cupboards, there are many brand names I don't recognize, in fact I can't even tell what language they're in we are in India, but he handles western dishes equally well makes me the most zesting yet subtle macaroni and cheese I've ever had, and his vegetarian tacos would be the envy of all of Mexico. I noticed something else. His cupboards are jam-packed. Behind every door and every shelf stand a mountains of neatly stacked cans and packages. A reserve of food to the last the siege of Leningrad. That was it. The end of chapter 6. And I think I skipped that small chapter when I did the review last time, but that's because we're getting small snippets of essentially what is current day. And so it's like introducing this one guy. We still don't really know much about him. It was a description of him like a couple chapters back, but like these are only going to be small descriptions until we get brought up to speed. But right now all we know about the guy is he's in India and he's a great cook and he has a lot of food in his house that's both Western and Indian and it's all name brands, and essentially we know he's like a rich cook. That's basically all we know at this point. Anyways, that's the end of chapter six. That was real simple. Chapter seven. It's my luck to have a few good teachers in my youth, men and women, who came into my dark head and lit a match. One of these was Mr. Satish Kumar, my biology teacher at Petit Seminaire, and an active communist who was always hoping Tamil Nadu would stop electing movie stars to go the way of Kerala. He had the most peculiar appearance. The top of his head was bald and pointy, yet he had the most impressive jowls I have ever seen, and his narrow shoulders give way to a massive stomach that looked like the base of a mountain. Except the mountain stood in thin air, for it all stopped abruptly and disappeared horizontally into his pants. It's a mystery to me how his stick-like legs supported the weight above them, but they did, though they moved in surprising ways at times, as if his knees could bend in any direction. His construction was geometric. He looked like two triangles, a small one and a large one, balanced on two parallel lines. But organic, quite warty actually, with sprigs of black hair sticking out of his ears, and friendly. His smile seemed to take up the whole base of the triangular head. Mr. Kumar was the most, the first avowed atheist I ever met. I discovered this was not in the classroom, but at the zoo. He was a regular visitor who read the labels and description notices in their entirety, and approved of every animal he saw. Each to him was a triumph of logic and mechanics, and nature as a whole was exceptionally fine illustration of science. To his ears, when an animal felt the urge to mate, it said, Gregor Mendel, recalling the father of genetics. And when it was time to show its metal, Charles Darwin, the father of natural selection. What we took to be bleeding, grunting, hissing, snorting, growling, roaring, howling, chirping, and screeching were but the thick accents of foreigners. When Mr. Kumar visited the zoo, it was to take the pulse of the universe, and his stethoscopic mind always confirmed to him that everything was in order, and everything saw order. He left the zoo feeling scientifically refreshed. The first time I saw his triangular form teetering and tottering about the zoo, I was shy to approach him. As much as I liked him as a teacher, he was a figure of authority and I a subject. I was a little afraid of him. I observed him at a distance. 
had just come to Rhinoceros Pit, and two Indian rhinos were attractions at the zoo because of the goats. Rhinos are social animals, and when we go to peak, a young wild male, he was showing signs of suffering from isolation, and he was eating less and less. As a stopgap measure, while he searched for a female, father thought of seeking if peak would be accustomed to living with goats. If it worked, it would have a valuable, it would save a valuable animal. If it didn't, it would only cost a few goats. It worked marvelously. Peak and the herd of goats became inseparable, even when sum Summit arrived. Now, when the rhinos bathed, the goats stood around the muddy pool, and when the goats ate their corner, ate in their corner, Peak and Summit stood next to them like guards. The living arrangement was very popular with the public. Mr. Kumar looked up and saw me. He smiled, and one hand holding onto the railing, the other waving, signaled to me to come over. Hello, Pi, he said. Hello, sir. It's good of you to come to the zoo. I come here all the time. One might say it's my temple. This is interesting, he was indicating to the pit. If we had politicians like these goats and rhinos, we'd, ne we'd have fewer problems in our country. Unfortunately, we have a prime minister who is the armor plating of a rhinoceros without of any of its good sense. I didn't know much about politics. Mother and father complained regularly about Mr. Gandhi, but it made little. It meant little to me. Why would you complain about Gandhi? She lived far away in the north, not in the zoo and not in Pondicherry, but I felt I had to say something. Religion will save us, I said, since when I could remember the religion had been very close to my heart. Religion, Mr. Kumar grinned broadly. I don't believe in religion. Religion is darkness. Darkness? I was puzzled. I thought darkness is the last thing that religion is. Religion is light. Was he testing me? Was he saying religion is darkness? The way he sometimes said things in class, like mammals lay eggs to see if anyone would correct him? Only platypuses, sir. There are no grounds for going beyond scientific explanation of reality, and no sound reason for believing anything but our sense experience. A clear intellect, close attention to detail, and little scientific knowledge will expose religion as a supersti superstitious bosh. God does not exist. Did he say that? Or am I remembering the lines of later atheists? At any rate, it was something of the sort. I never heard such words. Why tolerate darkness? Everything here is clear, if only we look carefully. He was pointing at Peak. Now I thought I had great admiration for Peak. I had thought of a rhinoceros as a light bulb. He spoke again. Some people say God died during the partition in 1947. He may have died in 1971 during the war, or he may have died yesterday here in Pondicherry in an orphanage. That's what some people say, Pi. When I was your age, I lived in a bed, racked with polio. I asked myself every day, Where is God? Where is he? Where is God? God never came. It wasn't God who saved me. It was medicine. Reason is my prophet, and it tells me that as I watch, as a watch stops, so we die. It's the end. If we watch, if the dot watch doesn't work perfectly, it must be fixed here and now by us. One day, we will take hold of the means of production, and there will be justice on earth. This was all a bit much for me. Oh yeah, I forgot he was a communist. That explains a lot. The tone was right, loving and brave, but the details seemed bleak. I said nothing. It wasn't for fear of angering Mr. Kumar. I was more afraid that in the few words thrown out might destroy something that I loved. What if his words had the effect of polio on me? What a terrible disease that must be if could kill God in a man. He walked off, pitching and rolling in the wild sea that was a steady ground. Don't forget the test on Tuesday. Study hard, 3.14. Yes, Mr. Kumar. He became my favorite teacher at Petit Seminaire, and the reasons I studied zoology at the University of Toronto. I felt kinship with him. It was my first clue that atheists are my brothers and sisters of a different faith, and every word they speak speaks of faith. Like me, they go as far as the legs of reason will carry them, and then they leap. I'll be honest about it. It's not atheists you get stuck in my craw, but agnostics. That is useful for a while. We almost pass through the Garden of Gethsemane. If Christ played with doubt, so must we. If Christ spent anguish night in prayer, if he burst out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forget, forsaken me? Then surely we are all permitted doubt. But we must move on. To choose doubt as a philosophy of life is akin to choosing immobility as a means of transportation. And that is the end of chapter 7. So here we learn of Pai's teacher, Mr. Kumar, and I have a cat. Oh, boy. Um, Sorry, Lola. And so, Mr. Kumar is a communist, and an atheist, as communists tend to be. And so, he is this, I don't know what he's a professor of exactly, but he's uh, focused a lot on 
zoology, I guess. And he's the reason that Pi studies zoology later in life. And in this, we learn that uh, there was one lone rhinoceros named Peak, and it was very confusing, because why would you name a rhinoceros Pink, Peak? Anyways, so the rhinoceros was really lonely, and they wanted to make him not lonely, because rhinoceroses are social animals. And so they put him in with the goats, and they were worried that we were going to lose some goats or anything, but they ended up getting him along really, really well. And so Mr. Kumar, Mr. Kumar um, goes to the zoo. He goes to the zoo very regularly, because it's like, it reminds him of, like, the perfection of nature and how everything kind of works together and, like... Anyway, so he sees this and he thinks it's very unusual. And that's the moment where he, like, essentially says that everything is explained by science. And then Pi's like, yeah, but religion's awesome. And then Mr. Kumar is like, oh, religion's darkness. You're basically... He doesn't, he doesn't say it insultingly. He says it uh, confidently and happily. He just says that... Science and reason are really the answers to everything. You can analyze it all the way down to the most basic things. And I was like, this is a weird point of view. But he doesn't, like, reject the point of view. Like, he doesn't reject atheism. Uh, he actually, he finds it almost admirable. It's their own religion. They, they believe in the physical. And as long as you're believing in something, it's good. And what he says he doesn't like is agnostics because they don't believe in anything. Really, they just have doubt of everything. And so they don't really know where they stand. And he's like, you can't really believe in nothing. Like, you can't question everything. At some point, you need to have some faith and some expectation of, like, the world. Anyways, that's, that's all we got so far. So I will catch you in the next video. Thank you so much for joining me for these three chapters. I'll catch you in the next couple. Goodbye. Welcome back, I'm Micah Reads, and I'm going to be reading Life of Pi, chapters 8 through 10. Yeah, I looked at uh, 8 through 10 of this book. It's by Jan Martel, and you should know that by now. I don't have to keep saying it, right? Yeah, cool. So, we've done our summaries. We already know where we're standing right now. We just covered Mr. Kumar's teacher, and we can move forward from there. So, chapter 8. We commonly stay in the, say in the trade that the most dangerous animal in a zoo is man. In a general way, we mean how our species' excessive predatoriness, predatoriness has made the entire planet our prey. More specifically, we have in mind the people who feed fish hooks to the otters, razors to the bears, apples with small nails in them to the elephants, and hardware vari variations on the theme, ballpoint pens, paper clips, safety pins, rubber bands, combs, coffee spoons, horseshoes, pieces of broken glass, rings, brooches, and other jewelry, and not just cheap plastic bangles, gold wedding bands too, drinking straws, plastic cutlery, ping pong balls, tennis balls, and so on. The obituary of zoo animals that have died from being fed foreign bodies would include gorilla, bison, storks, rays, ostriches, seals, sea lions, big cats, bears, camels, elephants, monkeys, and almost every variety of deer, rumnant, and songbird. Among zookeepers, Goliath's death is famous he was a bull elephant seal, a great, big, venerable beast of two-ton star of his European zoo, loved by all visitors. He died of internal bleeding after someone fed him a broken beer bottle. The cruelty is often more active and direct. The literature contains reports of the many torments inflicted upon zoo animals. A shoebill dying of shock after having its beak smashed with a hammer, a moose stag losing its beard along with a strip of flesh the size of an index finger to a visitor's knife, this same moose was poisoned six months later. A monkey's arm broken after reaching out for preferred nuts. A deer's antlers attacked with a hacksaw. A zebra stabbed with a sword. And other assaults on other animals. When walking sticks, umbrellas, hairpins, kneading needles, scissors, and whatnot. Often with an aim to take out an eye or injuring sexual parts. Animals are also poisoned. And there are indecencies even more bizarre. Onanists breaking sweat on monkeys, ponies, birds, a religious freak who cut a snake's head off, a deranged man who took to urinating on an elk's mouth. At Pondicherry, we were relatively fortunate. We were spared the sadists who plied European and American zoos. Nonetheless, our golden Argati vanished, stolen by someone who ate it, father suspected. 
Various birds, pheasants, peacocks, oh, peacocks, macaws, lost feathers to people greedy for their beauty. We caught a man with a knife climbing into the pen for a mouse deer. He said he was going to punish evil Ravana, who was the Ramaya took form of a deer when he kidnapped Sita, Rama's consort. I don't know enough about, like, Indian mythology to, like, understand any of that. Another man was nabbed in the process of stealing a cobra. He was a snake charmer whose own snake had died. Both were saved, a cobra from the life of servitude and music, and the man from possible death bite. We had to deal on occasion with the stone throwers, who found the animals too placid and wanted a reaction. And we had the lady whose sari was caught on a lion, sorry. She spun like a yo-yo, choosing mortal embarrassment over mortal end. The thing was, it wasn't even on an accident. She had leaned over, thrust her hand in the cage, and waved at her end of the sari in the lion's face with the intent we never figured out. She was not injured. There were many fascinated men who came to her assistance. Her flustered explanation to the father was, who ever heard of a lion eating old cotton scari? Sorry. <laughs> it sounds like I'm apologizing, but it's, I keep saying it different ways, but it's sorry. It's S-A-R-I. I thought lions were carnivorous. Our worst troublemakers were the visitors who gave food to animals. Despite our vigilance, Dr. Atal, the zoo veterinarian, could tell by the number of animals with digestive disturbances, which had been the busy days at the zoo. He called tidbit itties. The case of enteritis or gastritis due to many carbohydrates, especially sugar. Sometimes we wish people had stuck to sweets. People have a notion that animals can eat anything without the least consequence to their health. Not so. One of our sloth bears became seriously ill with several hemorrhagic, oh, hemorrhagic entities after being given fish that had gone putrid by a man who was convinced that he was doing a good deed. Just beyond the ticket booth, Father had painted on the wall in big, bright red letters the question, Do you know which is the most dangerous animal in the zoo? An arrow pointed to a small curtain. There were so many eager, curious hands that pulled the curtain and had to replace it regularly. Behind it was a mirror. But I learned at my expense that Father believed there was another animal even more dangerous than us, and one that was extremely common, too, found on every continent and every habitat. The round... The redoubtable species, Animalis anthro... Oh, but I'm not even going to do it. Oh, wait. Anthropomorphicus, the animal seen through human eyes. We've all met one, perhaps even owned one. It's an animal that is cute, friendly, loving, devoted, merry, and understanding. All of these in quotations. These animals lie in ambush in every toy store and children's zoo. Countless stories are told of them. They are the pendants of these vicious, bloodthirsty, depraved animals that in blame the ire of the maniacs I've just mentioned, who vent their spite on them with walking sticks and umbrellas. In both cases, we look at an animal and see a mirror. The obsession with putting ourselves at the center of anything is a bane to not only theologians, but also zoologists. I learned a lesson that an animal is an animal, essentially and practically removed from us twice, once with Father and once with Richard Parker. Okay, come on, I gotta go back. Uh, who, is it? Is it still man? Is... Okay, I get it. Okay, uh, I'll explain that later. I learned a lesson that an animal is an animal, essentially and practically removed from us twice, once from Father and once with Richard Parker. It was on a Sunday morning. I was quietly playing on my own. Father called out, Children, come here. Something was wrong. His tone and voice set off a small alarm bell in my head. I quickly re reviewed my conscience. It was clear. Robbie must be in trouble again. I wondered what he had done this time. I walked into the living room. Mother was there. That was usual. The disciplining of children, like the tending of animals, was generally left to father. Ravi walked in last, guild written all over his criminal face. Ravi Pasin, I have a very important lesson for you today. Oh, really, is this necessary? interrupted mother. Her face was flushed. I swallowed. If mother, normally so unruffled, so calm, was worried, even upset, meant we were in serious trouble. I exchanged glances with Ravi. Yes, it is, father annoyed. It may be well, it may be very well to save their lives. Save our lives? It's no longer a small alarm bell that was ringing in my head. There were big bells now, like the ones we heard from Sacred Heart of Jesus Church, not too far from the zoo. But Pasheen, he's only eight, Mother insisted. He's the what? He's the one who worries me the most. I'm innocent, I burst out. It's Ravi's fault, whatever it is. He did it. What? said Ravi. I haven't done anything wrong. He gave me the evil eye. Shush, said father, raising his hand. He was looking at mother. Gita, you've seen Pasheen. He's at the age where boys run around and poke their noses everywhere. 
B. A run around her. An everywhere nose poker? Not so, not so. Defend me, mother, defend me. I implored in my heart, but she only sighed, sighed and nodded. A signal that the terrible business could proceed. Come with me, said father. We set out like prisoners off to their execution. We left the house, went through the gate, entered the zoo. It was early, and the zoo hadn't opened yet to the public. Animal keepers and groundskeepers were going about their work. I noticed Sidaram, who oversaw the orangutans, my favorite keeper. He paused to watch us go by. We passed birds, bears, apes, monkeys, ungulates, the terrarium house, the rhinos, the elephants, the giraffes. I really don't like how he does lists like this. It's the most annoying to read. Came to the big cats, our tigers, lions, and leopards. Babu, their keeper, was waiting for us. We went around and down the path, and he unlocked the door to the cat house, which was the center of a moated island. We entered. It was vast and dim cement cavern, circular in shape, warm and humid, and smelling of cat urine. All around were big, great big cages divided by thick green iron bars. A yellowish light filtered down from the skylights. Through the cage exits, we could see a vegetation of the surrounding island, flooded with sunlight. The cages were empty, save one, Mahisha, our Bengal tiger, patriarch of lanky, uh, lanky hulking beast of 550 pounds, had been detained. As soon as we stepped in, he hopped up to the bars of his cage and set off a full-throated snarl, ears flat against his skull and round eyes fixed on Babu. The sound was so loud and fierce it seemed to shake the whole cat house. My knees quickly started, oh, my knees started quaking. I got close to Mother. She was trembling, too. Even Father seemed to pause and steady himself. Only Babu was indifferent to the outburst of the searing stare that bored into him like a drill. He had tested trust on iron bars. Mahisha started pacing to and fro against the limits of his cage. Father turned to us. What animal is that? He bellowed above, Mahisha snarling. It's a tiger! Ravi and I answered in unison, obedi obediently pointing out the blindingly obvious. Are tigers dangerous? Yes, father. Tigers are dangerous. Tigers are very dangerous, father shouted. I want you to understand that you are never, under any circumstances, to touch a tiger. To pet a tiger, to put your hands through the bars of a cage, even get close to a cage. Is that clear, Ravi? Ravi nodded vigorously. Machine. I nodded even more vigorously. He kept his eyes on me. I nodded so hard I'm surprised my neck didn't snap my head and my head fall to the floor. I would say, in then my own defense, that I thought I might have anthropomorphized the animals till they spoke fluent English, the pheasants complaining in uppity British accents of their tea being cold, and baboons planning their bank robbery getaway of the flat menacing tones of American gangsters. The fancy was always conscious. I quite deliberately dressed wild animals in tame costumes of my imagination, but I never deluded myself as the real nature of my playmates. My poking nose had more sense than that. I didn't know where Father got the idea that his youngest son was itching to step into a cage with a ferocious carnivore. But wherever the strange worry came from, and my father was a worrier, he was always clearly determined to rid himself of that every morning, or rid himself of that that very morning. I'm going to show you how dangerous tigers are, he continued. Oh, please jump in the cage and end your life. That would just make my day. Except they wouldn't, and that's terrible. God, I'm such a bad person. Anyways, I want you to remember this lesson for the rest of your lives. It feels like it's leading up to that. He turned to Babu and nodded. Babu left. Mahisha's eyes followed him and did not move from the door he disappeared through. He returned a few seconds later, carrying a goat with its legs tied. Why? Mother gripped me from behind. Mahisha's snarl turned to a growl deep in the throat. Babu unlocked... Okay, the reason I'm asking why is partially because the goat doesn't stand a chance against the tiger. Why tie its legs? And also partially, this is a really messed up thing to show your kids. Anyways... Babu unlocked, opened, entered, closed, and locked the cage next to the tiger's cage. Bars and a trapdoor separated the two. Immediately, Mahisha was against the dividing bars, pawing at them. To his growling, he now had an explosive arrested woofs. Babu placed the goat on the floor. Its flanks were heaving violently. Its tongue hung from its mouth, and its eyes were spinning orbs. Uh. He untied its legs. The goat got to its feet. Babu exited the cage in the same careful way he had entered. The cage had two floors, one level with us and the other at the back, higher about three feet that led out to the island. The goat scrambled to the second level. Mahisha, now unconcerned with Babu, paralleled the move in his cage in a fluid, effortless motion. He crouched and lay still, his slowly moving tail, the only sign of tension. Babu stepped up to the trapdoor between the cages and started pulling it open. 
In anticipation of satisfa- satisfaction, Mahisha fell silent. I heard two things at that moment. Father saying, Never forget this lesson, as he looked on grimly, and the bleeding of the goat. It must have been bleeding all along, only we couldn't hear it before. I could feel a mother's hand pressed against my pounding heart. The trapdoor resisted with sharp cries. Mahisha was beside himself. He looked as if he were about to burst through the bars. It seemed to hesitate between staying where he was at the place where prey was closest, but most certainly out of reach, and moving to the ground level, further away, where the trapdoor was located. He raised himself and started snarling again. The goat started to jump. It jumped to amazing heights. I had no idea that goats could jump so high. But the back of the cage was a high and smooth cement wall. With sudden ease, the trapdoor slid open. Silence fell again, except for bleeding and the click-click of the goat's hooves against the floor. A streak of black and orange flowed from one cut cage to the next. Normally, big cats were not given f- were not given food one day a week to stimulate conditions in the wild. That doesn't seem well written. Anyways, we found that later the father had ordered that he should not be fed for three days. I don't know if I saw blood before turning to mother's arms, or if I daubed it on later in my memory with big brush, but I heard it. It was enough to scare the living vegetarian daylights out of me. Mother bundled us out. We were in hysteria. She was incensed. How could you, Santosh? They're children. They'll be scarred for the rest of their lives. Her voice was hot and tremulous. Also, they already know tigers are dangerous. Like, this is a completely unnecessary and over-the-top response and i don't even know why he did it anyways we'll find out i could see she had tears in her eyes i felt better gita my bird it's for their sakes what if pashin had stuck his hand through the bars of the cage one day to touch the pretty orange fur better a goat than him no his voice was soft nearly a whisper he looked contrite he never called her my bird in front of us we were huddled around her he joined us but the lesson was not over though it was gentler after that father led us to the lions and the leopards Once there was a madman in Australia who was a black belt in karate. He wanted to prove himself against the lions. He lost, badly. The keepers found only half his body in the morning. Yes, father. The Himalayan bears and the sloth bears. One strike of their claws with these cuddly creatures and your innards would be scooped out and splattered all over the ground. Yes, father. The hippos. With these soft, flabby mouths of of theirs, they will crush your body to a bloody pulp. On land, they can outrun you. Yes, father. The hyenas, the strongest jaws in nature. Don't think they're cowardly, or that they only eat carrion. They're not, and they don't. They'll start eating you while you're still alive. Yes, father. The orangutans. As strong as ten men, they'll break your bones as if they were twigs. I know some of them were once pets and you played with them when they were small, but now they're grown up and wild and unpredictable. Yes, father. The ostrich. Looks flustered and silly, doesn't it? Listen up. One of the most dangerous animals in the zoo. Just one kick and your back is broken or your torso is crushed. Yes, father. The spotted deer. So pretty, aren't they? If the male feels he has to, it will charge you and those short little antlers will pierce you like daggers. Yes, father. The Arabian camel. One slobbering bite and you'll lose a chunk of flesh. Yes, father. The black swans. With their beaks, they'll crack your skull. With their wings, they'll break your arms. Eh. Yes, father. The smaller birds, they'll cut through your fingers with their beaks as if they were butter. Yes, father. The elephants, the most dangerous animal of all. More keepers and visitors are killed by elephants than any other animal in a zoo. A young elephant will most likely dismember you and trample your body parts flat. That's what happened to one poor lost soul in a European zoo who got into the elephant house through a window. An older, more patient animal will squeeze you against a wall or sit on you. Sounds funny, but think about it. Yes, father. There are animals we haven't stopped by. Don't think they're harmless. Life will defend itself no matter how small it is. Every animal is ferocious and dangerous. It may not kill you, but it will certainly injure you. It will scratch you and bite you, and you can look forward to a swollen, pus-filled infection, a high fever, and ten days stay in the hospital. Yes, Father. We came to the guinea pigs, and the only other animal besides Mahisha would have been starved at Father's orders, having been, deni- having been denied their previous evening's meal. Father unlocked the cage. He brought out a bag of feed from his pocket and emptied it on the floor. See these guinea pigs? Yes, father. The creatures were trembling with the weakness as they frantically nibbled their kernels of corn. Well, he leaned down and scooped one up. They're not dangerous. The other guinea pigs scattered instantly. 
Father laughed, and he handed me one of the squealing guinea pig. He meant to end on a light note. The guinea pig rested my arms tensely. It was a young one. I went through the cage and carefully lowered it onto the floor. It rushed to its mother's side. The only reason these guinea pigs weren't dangerous, he didn't draw blood, weren't dangerous, didn't draw blood with their teeth and claws, was they were practically domesticated. Otherwise, to grab a wild guinea pig with your bare hands would be like taking hold of a knife by the blade. The lesson was over. Robbie and I sulked and gave father the cold shoulder for a week. Mother ignored him, too. When I went by the rhinoceros pit, I fancied the rhino's head were hung low with sadness over the loss of one of their dear companions. What can you do when you love your fa- do when you love your father? Life goes on and you don't touch tigers, except that for now, for having accused Ravi of an unspecified crime he hadn't committed, I was as good as dead. In years subsequent, when he was in the mood to terrorize me, he would whisper to me, "Just wait till we're alone. You're the next goat." <laughs> okay, so what a weird chapter and. I've been reading too much today, it seems, and my tongue's starting to stumble over itself. And we do still have two more chapters. I will read them. Uh, I'm just going to give you a quick summary here. So, when we were going back to here, we were talking about the most dangerous animal in the zoo. Remember that? Uh, they said it was man, but then he also said it was animal, animalis, anthropomorphous, whatever that is right there. Yeah, that is when we anthropomorphize animals and we think they're like people, but they're really not like people. And so we like think they're all friendly and nice, and that's the most dangerous animal. It's any animal that you underestimate in its like ability to defend itself and kill things and just be an animal because they're animals. That's the most dangerous animal. Any animal you underestimate. Boom. Yeah. And so anyway, this whole thing. It was an awful lesson for his children. Um, uh, Pi's father uh, said, I don't know why he was mad at Ravi, or Ravi maybe didn't do anything, but his father was like, hey, so I'm upset for some reason, and I want to teach you how dangerous these animals are. So he took him to a tiger pit, and he brought a goat to the tiger pit, and then had that goat eaten by a tiger. It was awful. Like, the kids watched... Well, they didn't watch it. They turned away real quick. But a goat got completely, like, demolished by a tiger in front of them, and there was no good reason for it either. The dad had, like, starved the tiger so that it would be hungry and want to kill the goat. And so, yeah. That's pretty awful. And so that... And then he goes through all the animals in the zoo and how dangerous they are and all that. And so it's really just a lesson for the kids that really don't, don't mess with animals. Yeah. Anyways, so moving on to chapter 9. Oh, and he ended with uh, guinea pigs. He said, they're not dangerous. Guinea pigs aren't dangerous at all. He was trying to be, like, light with the ending there. But, like, a wild guinea pig will, like, bite your finger off or something. These guinea pigs are totally safe. Anyway, it's chapter 9. Getting animals used to the presence of humans is at the heart of art and science of zookeeping. The key aim is to diminish an animal's flight distance, which is the minimum distance at which an animal wants to keep a perceived enemy. A flam flamingo in the wild won't mind you as you stay more than 300 yards away. Cross that limit, and it becomes tense. Get even closer, and you trigger a flight reaction, in which the bird will not cease until a 300-yard limit is set again, or until heart and lungs fail. Different animals have different flight distances, and they gauge them in different ways. Cats look, deers listen, bears smell. Giraffes will allow you to come to within 30 yards of them. If you're in a motor car, but if you but will run if you are 150, way on, 150 yards away on foot. Fiddler crabs scurry away when you're 10 yards away. Howler monkey, monkeys stir in their branches where you're at 20. African buffaloes react at, 20, at 75. Our tools for diminishing flight distance are knowledge we have of an animal. The food and the shelter we provide, the perfect protection we afford when it works, the result of an emotionally stable, stress-free, wild animal. And that not only stays put, but is healthy, lives a very long time, eats without fuss, behaves and socializes in natural ways, and the best sign, reproduces. I won't say that our zoo, compared to the zoos of San Diego, or Toronto, or Berlin, or Singapore, but you, can, you can't keep a good zookeeper down. Father was a natural. He made up for lack of formal training with an intuitive gift and a keen eye. He had a knack for looking at an animal and guessing what was on his mind. He was attentive to its charges, and they in return multiplied thumb to excess. And so this chapter, again, real short, just like the next one will be, uh, essentially says that animals naturally react to danger 
at certain distances. This animal does this distance, this animal does this distance. And the point of a zookeeper, or not the point of a zookeeper, but the intention of a zookeeper is to reduce that distance, just making them comfortable, making them healthy. And the best indicator of them being like comfortable with people around and they're like shorter than the normal natural distance is when they'll like reproduce and when they'll just live really long times and not be tense all the time. So reproduction is the best way to know that you have a good zoo because then you know your animals are comfortable. And Pi's father apparently takes pride in how well his zoo is doing because all of his animals are reproducing a lot and some way too much. And so, moving on, chapter 10. Yet there will always be animals that seek to escape from zoos. Animals that are kept unsuitable enclosures are the most obvious example. Every animal has a particular habitat need that must be met. If its enclosure is too sunny or too wet or too empty, if its perch is too high, too exposed, if the ground is too sandy, if there are too few branches to make a nest, if the food trough is too low, if there is not enough mud to wallow in, and so many other ifs, then the other animal will not be at peace. It is not so much a question of constructing an imitation of conditions in the wild as of getting to the essence of these conditions. Everything is an enclosure and must be just right, in other words, within the limits of the animal's capacity to adapt. A plague upon bad zoos with bad enclosures. They bring all zoos into disrepute. Wild animals that are captured when they are fully mature are another example of escape-prone animals. Often they are too set in their ways to reconstruct their subjective worlds and adapt to a new environment. But even animals that were bred in zoos and have never known the wild, that are perfectly adapted to their enclosures and feel no tension in the presence of humans, will have moments of excitement and push them to seek escape. All living things contain a measure of madness that moves them in strange, sometimes inexplicable ways. This madness can be saving. It is part and partial the ability to adapt. Without it, no species would survive. Whatever the reason for wanting to escape, sane or insane, zoo detractors should not should realize that animals don't escape to somewhere but from something. Something within their territory has frightened them. The intrusion of an enemy, the assault of a dom- dominant animal, a startling noise, and set, a fl- set off the flight reaction. The animal flees or tries to. I was surprised to read at the Toronto Zoo, a very fine zoo, I might add, that leopards can jump 18 feet straight up. Our leopard enclosure in Pondicherry had a wall 16 feet high at the back. I surmised that Rosie and Copycat never jumped out, not because of constitutional weakness, but simply because they had no reason to. Animals that escape go from the known to the unknown, and if there's one thing an animal hater... Uh, an animal hates above all else is the unknown. Escaping animals usually hide in the very first place they find that gives them a sense of security. They are dangerous only to those who happen to get between them and their wreck and safe spot. And that's the end of chapter 10. Another short chapter, but this one uh, essentially is maybe giving us hints as to the future, maybe, perhaps, is what is going to happen in the story. It's giving an understanding of how animals react to different things. And so... We already have established that animals in a zoo will feel safe, and that's how you know it's a good zoo if they reproduce and stuff like that. But if something changes, even something minute, which we also have covered in this book, uh, like if a shadow changes or something startles the animal in some way, then the animal will have a flight reaction. And whereas a good zoo has animals that don't, like, hate their enclosure, they just feel like it's a good place for them to be living, if they're startled, they will try and escape from not the enclosure itself, just escape from the changes that are happening, because animals hate change. And so they will go from their normal habitat to wherever they feel safest, and anything in between them and that safe spot uh, is essentially going to get killed or mauled or something like that, because the animal is running away and it doesn't care about anything at all except for its own safety. And so that was really the whole point of that chapter, just saying things that are are... Things that change in an animal's environment will startle it. And once it's startled, then it'll seek out something safe feeling. And anything that gets in the way of its feeling safe will be attacked. Yeah, that's about it. Cool. And that's the end of the readings for today. Looks like we are a little bit longer than the last one, but it all works out. I mean, we got like three chapters in. So, thank you so much for joining me. I'll catch you in the next video. Bye.
Welcome back, I'm Micah Reeds, and we are going to be continuing Life of Pi. We are on chapter 11. I know we're just burning through this, but again, there's like 95 chapters, and they're all real short, except for some of them which are really long. Anyways, moving on, chapter 11. Consider the case of the female black leopard that escaped from the Zurich Zoo in the winter of 1933. She was new to the zoo and seemed to get along with the male leopard, but various paw injuries hinted at the matrimonial strife. Before any decision could be taken about what to do, she squeezed through a break in the roof bars of her cage and vanished in the night. The discovery that a wild carnivore was free in their midst created an uproar among the citizens of Zurich. Traps were set, and hunting dogs were let loose. They only rid the canton of its few half-wild dogs. Not a trace of the leopard was found for ten weeks. Finally, a casual laborer came upon it in a barn twenty-five miles away and shot it. Remains of roe deer were found nearby. That's a big, black, tropical cat, managed to survive for more than two months in a Swiss winter without being seen by anyone, let alone attacking anyone. Speaks plainly about the fact that escaped zoo animals are not dangerous, absconding animals, or criminals, but simply wild creatures seeking to fit in. And this case is just one of many. If you took the city of Tokyo and turned it upside down and shook it, you would be amazed at the animals that would fall out. It would pour more than cats and dogs, I tell you. Boa constrictors, Komodo dragons, crocodiles, piranhas, ostriches, wolves, lynx, wallabies, manatees, porcupines, orangutans, wild boar. And that's the sort of rainfall you could expect on your umbrella. You expect to find, ha, ah, in the middle of a Mexican tropical jun jungle, imagine. Ha <laughs> ha, it's laughable, simply laughable. What are they thinking? And so in that chapter, I guess it's kind of leading up to something else. Uh, so this chapter essentially just states that at one point, uh, to emphasize on what happened in the previous chapter as far as animals escaping from their enclosures, uh, one of the Black Panthers escaped from a Zurich Zoo, and the panther in the middle of, like, Switzerland uh, just survived for, like, two months in the cold, and it's a tropical cat, so it shouldn't be able to, but really it just, like, slinked on through the night, and for two months, no one even knew where it was, and it was found in a barn after, like, killing some deer, and the guy shot the panther, whatever it was, that escaped. But really, it didn't, didn't need to be shot, because it wasn't hurting anyone. It just killed a couple deer. It was just surviving, and it wanted to stay out of the way. It didn't want to, like, attack people. It really just surviving on its own didn't really need to be interfered with. It would have been fine. But, you know, that's that. And so then he goes on to saying that among us things are always like lurking and you just don't know about it like if you took Tokyo and turned it upside down then all of the tropical creatures that live in Japan would have just fall out of it just hiding in places where you never would have thought to see them because they're just surviving like they're despite it being like an urban jungle it's an awful way to phrase it or a great way to phrase it depending on how you like puns um <laughs> so there'll be tons of things living in cities with you and you'd never know about it because they're just surviving and staying low key because they don't want to like get killed they're just making their own environment they're adapting to the situations around them anyways moving on chapter 12 at times he gets agitated it's nothing i say i say very little it's his own story that does it memory is an ocean and he bobs on its surface i worry that he'll want to stop but he wants to tell me a story he goes on. After all these years, Richard Parker still preys on his mind. He's a sweet man. Every time I visit, he prepares a South Indian vegetarian feast. I told him, I like spicy food. I don't know why I said such a stupid thing. It's a complete lie. I had a dollop of yogurt after dollop of yogurt. Nothing doing. Each time it's the same. My taste buds shrivel up and die. My skin, beat, my skin gets beet red, and my eyes well up with tears. My head feels like a house on fire. And my digestive tract starts with a twist and groan in agony like a boa constrictor that has swallowed a lawnmower. And that's the end of chapter 12. Again, another short one, but this is a snippet into the present. And now I know, at least I think, that the person that they're describing here is actually Pi. And this person here is not the speaker, the first person you were getting through all these chapters. This is actually somebody else looking at Pi after Pi has gotten back from whatever he's done that we're not I'm not gonna tell you about. Something to do with this cover here. Yeah. So after this, I think the guy with all the food in his house and he's a good cook and all that, um is pie. Yeah. And the person visiting is uh from what this chapter looks like, he's getting the story from Pi because he wants to hear uh what he went through. 
That's my guess. I don't really have a good understanding of what's going on. Anyways, we'll find out more. Chapter 13, right? What is our last chapter in this series for today, anyways? <clears throat> chapter 13. So you see, if you fall into a lion's pit, the reason the lion will tear you to pieces is not because it's hungry. Be assured zoo animals are amply fed, or because it's bloodthirsty, but because you've invaded its territory. An aside, that's why a circus trainer must always enter a lion ring first, and then in full sight of the lions. In doing so, he establishes that the ring is his territory, not theirs, a notion that he reinforces by shouting, stomping about, by snapping his whip. The lions are impressed. Their disadvantage weighs heavily on them. Notice how when they come in mighty predators, though they are, king of beasts, they crawl in with their tails low to keep the edges of the ring, which is always round so that they have nowhere to hide. They are in the presence of a strongly dominant male, a super alpha male, and they must submit to his dominance rituals. So they open their jaws wide, and they sit up, and they jump through paper-covered hoops, and they crawl through tubes, they walk backwards, and they roll over. He's a queer one, they think dimly. Never seen a top lion like him, but he runs a good pride. The larder is always full, and let's be honest, mates, his antics keep us busy. Napping all the time does get a bit boring. <laughs> At least we're not riding bicycles like the brown bears or catching flying plates like the chimps. Only his trainer better make sure he always remains super alpha. He'll pay dearly if he unwittingly slips to beta. Much hostile and aggressive behavior among animals is the expression of social insecurity. The animal in front of you must know where he stands, whether above you or below you. Social rank is central to how it leads its life. Rank determines who can associate with and how where and when it can eat, and when it can rest, where it can drink, and so on, until it knows a rank for a certain. The animal lives a life of unbearable anarchy. It remains nervous, jumpy, dangerous. Luckily for the circus trainer, decisions about social rank among higher animals are not always based on brute force. Hediger, 1950, says, When two creatures meet, the one that is able to intimidate its opponent is recognized as socially superior, so that a social decision does not always depend on a fight. An encounter in some circumstances may be enough. Words of a wise animal man. Mr. Hedger was for many years a zoo director, first of the Basil Zoo and then of Zurich Zoo. He was a man well versed in the ways of animals. It's a question of brain over brawn. The nature of a circus trainer's ascendancy is psychological. Foreign surroundings. The trainer's erect posture, calm demeanor, steady gaze, fearless step forward, strange roar, for example the snapping of the whip or the blowing of a whistle, there's so many factors that will fill an animal's mind with doubt and fear and make it clear to where it stands. The very thing it wants to know. Satisfied, number two will back down and number one can turn the audience and shout, Let the show go on, and now, ladies and gentlemen, through hoops of real fire. And that is the end of chapter 13. So essentially, this is stating as long as you can, or not you, as long as a person can establish themselves as the dominating creature, uh... It doesn't need to be a fight, essentially. So rather than, like, a wild animal, like, approaching you and you having to, like, prove that you're better than it physically, all you have to do is state, like, essentially in an animal's language, which is represented through loud noises and posture and approaching without fear, uh, all of these things will make an animal question. And if an animal is questioning its decisions, then it will assume that it's not the dominating one because the dominating one has no doubts like it's clearly knows what it's doing and so when a trainer like in a circus like cracks a whip and like moves towards the line the line will be like oh what's going on like i'm clearly not the dominant one here because i don't know what's going on so like they immediately fall to tier two and they'll do things that the trainers says like it'll whatever they want them to do essentially like jump through hoops climb on things climb through tubes like essentially like the lion just says, that's that's a weird alpha, but, like, I'll do whatever he says, because, like, I don't know what's going on. So, like, as long as there's indecision in the lion or whatever is being trained, then that thing will remain submissive, because they don't want to approach something they don't understand and then end up dying from it. So it's an interesting way to manipulate instincts, and I think it'll play later into the storyline. I, I mean, everything should, right? Anyways, I'm going to get one more chapter in here, because it's, like, real short. So, hop into chapter 14. It's interesting to note that the lion is the most amenable to the circus trainer's tricks, is the one with the lowest social standing in the pride, the omega animal. It is the most to gain from a close relationship with a super alpha trainer. It's not only a matter of extra treats. A close relationship will also mean protection from the other members of the pride. 
It is a compliant animal to the public, no different from the others in size and apparent ferocity. It will be the star of the show, while the trainer leaves the beta and gamma lines more cantankerous subordinates sitting on the colorful barrels on the edge of the ring. Same is true from other circus animals. It is also seen in zoos. Socially inferior animals are the ones that make the most strenuous, strenuous, resourceful efforts to get to know their keepers. They prove to be the ones faithful to them, most to near their company, least likely to challenge them or be difficult. The phenomenon has been observed with big cats, bison, deer, wild sheep, monkeys, and many other animals. It is in fact commonly known in the trade. And so, what this states right here is that... The animal you want to be dealing with is the animal that is most submissive. Um, yeah, the, the Omega animal. Because it wants to please the leader of the group. It wants to be right next to the leader because the leader will protect them and essentially allow for it to live well. It will provide it food and all of that stuff. So essentially these like leech-type animals like an Omega lion will... like want to satisfy its trainer because it sees the trainer as the alpha and the trainer will be able to protect it and take care of it. And so these are the kinds of animals you want. Not all of the lions are. Uh, those The ones that aren't the omegas that are really just really submissive and want to help are the ones that are going to be off to the side because those ones aren't going to be obeying as well. They're going to wait for a moment to attack the trainer. And so you stay away from those and you just keep the, keep the omega around because he's going to be the one that performs best and people will enjoy watching and so that's that's all that that states okay that's the end of chapter 14 i will catch you guys in the next video right right all right bye Welcome back, I'm Micah Reeds, and we are going to be reading Life of Pi by Jan Martel, chapters 15 through 17. Yeah, cool. Alright, so, I'm not going to waste your time with a long introduction, so let's just get started. His house is a temple. In the entrance hall hangs a framed picture of Ganesha, he of the elephant head. He sits facing out, rosy-colored, pot-bellied, crowning and smiling. Three hands holding various objects, the fourth held palm out in blessing and in greeting. He is the Lord Overcomer of Obstacles, the God of Good Luck, and the God of Wisdom, the Patron of Learning. Sympatico in the highest. He brights a smile to my lips, at his feet an attentive rat. His vehicle, because when Lord Ganesh travels, he travels atop a rat. On the wall opposite, the picture is a plain wooden cross. In the living room, on a table next to the sofa, there is a small framed picture of Virgin Mary at Guadalupe, Flowers trembling from her open mantle. Next to it is a framed photo of a black-robed Kaaba, holiest santum of Islam, surrounded by ten thousand-fold swirl of the faith. On the television set is a brass statue of Shiva as Nat Nataraja, the cosmic lord of the dance, who controls the motions of the universe and the flow of time. He dances on the demon of ignorance, his forearms held out in choreographical gesture one foot on the demon's back, the other lifted in the air. When Nataraja brings his foot down, they say time will stop. There is a shrine in the kitchen. It is set on a cupboard, with whose door has replaced with a fretwork arch. The arch partly hides the yellow light bulb, but in the evening lights up the shrine. Two pictures rest behind a small altar to the side. Ganesha, again, and in the center, in a larger frame, smiling, blue-skinned, Krishna, playing the flute. Both have smears of red and yellow powder on the glass over their foreheads. In a copper dish in the altar are three silver Mertz, Mertis representations. He identifies them for me for, with a pointer. Lakshmi, Shakti, the mother goddess in the form of the Parvati, and Krishna, this time, as a playful baby crawling on all fours. In between the goddess is a stone, Shiva, Yoni Linga, which looks like half an avocado with a phallic stump rising from its center. A Hindu symbol representing the male and female energies of the universe. To one side of the dish is a small conch shell next, uh, set on a pedestal. To the other, a small silver handbell. Grains of rice lie about, as well as a flower just beginning to wilt. 
Many of these items are anointed with dabs of yellow and red. On the shelf below are various articles of dev devotation. A beaker full of water, a copper spoon, a lamp with a wick soiled in oil, sticks of incense and small bowls full of red powder, yellow powder, grains of rice and lumps of sugar. There's another Virgin Mary in the dining room. Upstairs in his office there's a brass Ganesha sitting cross-legged next to the computer. A wooden Christ on the cross from Brazil on a wall and a green prayer rug in a corner. The Christ is expressive. He suffers. The prayer rug lays its own clear space. Next to it, on a low book stand, is a book covered by cloth. At the center of the cloth is a single Arabic word, intricately woven, four letters, an alif, two lambs, and a ha, the word God in Arabic. The book on the bedside table is a Bible. And that is the end of chapter 15. Again, uh, we are going to be assuming that this guy's place that we're describing this is one of those chapters all in italics because we think it's present day or at least i think it's present day and it's describing pi's house because pi is like religious studies plus zoology uh i think and so like that if he's religious studies he would have a representation of multiple religions in his home if he really believed in such things yeah cool so chapter 16 right moving on yeah okay <clears throat> We're all born like Catholics, aren't we, in limbo, without religion, until some figure introduces us to God. After that meeting, the matter ends for most of us. If there's a change, it's usually for the lesser rather than the greater. Many people seem to lose God along life's way. That was not my case. The figure in question for me was an older sister of mother's, a more traditional mind who brought me to a temple when I was a small baby. Auntie Rohini was delighted to meet her newborn nephew and thought she would include mother goddess in the delight it will be his forever symbolic oh it will be his first symbolic it will be his symbolic first outing she said it's some tamskara symbolic indeed we were in madurai i was a fresh veteran of a seven hour train journey no matter off we went to this hindu rite of passage mother carrying me auntie propelling her I have no conscious memory of this first go-around in a temple, but some smell of incense, some play of light and shadow, some flame, some burst of color, something of the sultriness and mystery of the place must have stayed with me. A germ of religious exaltation, no bigger than a mustard seed, was sown into me and left to germinate. It never stopped growing since that day. I'm a Hindu because of sculptured cones of red camcum powder, the baskets of yellow turmeric nuggets, because of garlands of flowers and pieces of broken coconut, because of the clanging of bells to announce one's arrival to God, because of the wine of the reedy Nadarwasam, and the beating of drums, because of the patter of bare feet against stone floors, down dark corridors pierced by shafts of sunlight, because of the fragrance of incense, because of flames of Arati lamps circling in the darkness because of bajans being sweetly sung, because of elephants standing up to bless, because of colorful murals telling of colorful stories, because of foreheads carrying variously signified the same word, faith. I became loyal to these sense or impressions, for I knew what they meant, or who they were for. It is my heart that commands me so. I feel at home in Hindu temple. I am aware of a presence, not personal the way that we usually feel presence, but something larger. My heart still skips a beat when I catch sight of the murti, of God residing in the inner sanctum of a temple. Naturally, or truly, I am a sa sacred cosmic womb, a place where everything is born, and it is my sweet luck to behold its living core. My hands naturally come together in reverent worship. A hunger for pras prasad, the sugary offering to God that comes back to us as a sanctified treat. My palms need to feel the heat of hallowed flame, whose blessing I bring to my eyes and forehead. For religion is more than right and ritual. This is what the right and ritual stand for. Here too I am Hindu. The universe makes sense to me through Hindu's eyes. There is a Brahman, the word soul, a sustaining frame upon which is woven, warp, and weft, the cloth of being and all of the decorative elements of space and time. There is Brahman Nagurna, without qualities, which lies beyond understanding, beyond description, beyond approach. With poor, our poor words, we sew a suit for it. One, truth, unity, absolute, ultimate, reality. Ground of being, and trying to make it fit, but Brahman Nagura always bursts at the seams. We are left speechless. But there's also Brahman Saguna, which qualifies where the suit fits. We call it Shiva, Krishna, Shakti, Ganesha. We can approach it some, with some understanding. 
can discern certain attributes, loving, merciful, frightening, and we feel the gentle pull of relationship. Brahman Saguna is Brahman made manifest to our limited senses. Brahman expressed not only in gods, but in humans, animals, trees, and a handful of earth, for everything has a trace of, of the divine in it. The truth of life is that Brahman is no different from Atman, the spiritual force within us, what you might call the soul. The individual soul touches upon the world soul. The world soul, like a well, reaches for the water table. That which sustains the, sustains the universe beyond thought and language. And that which is at the core of us in the struggles for expression is the same thing. The finite within the infinite. The infinite within, within the finite. If you ask me how Brahman and Atman relate precisely, I would say in the same way that Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit relate. Mysteriously. But one thing is clear. Atman seeks to realize Brahman, be united with the Absolute, and it travels in this life on a pilgrimage where it is born and dies, and is born again and dies again and again and again, until it manages to shed the sheaths that imprison it here below. The paths to liberation are numerous, but the bank along the way is the same, the bank of karma. But the liberation account for each of us is credited or debited depending on our actions. This, in a holy nutshell, is Hinduism, and I have been a Hindu all my life. With its notions in mind, I see a place in the universe, we sh but we should not cling. A plague upon fundamentalists and literalists, I'm reminded of a story of Lord Krishna, and he was a cow-haired, coward. He's not a coward, C-A-W-A-R, he's a cow-herd, he herds cows, okay, good. Every night he invites the milkmaids to dance with him in the forest. They come, and they dance. The night is dark, and fire in their midst roars and crackles. The beat of the music gets ever faster. The girls dance and dance and dance with their sweet lord, who has made himself so abundant as to be in the arms of each and every girl. But the moment the girls become possessive, the moment in which she imagines that Krishna is her partner alone, she, he vanishes. So it is that we should not be jealous with God. I know a woman here in Toronto who is very dear to my heart. She is my foster mother. I call her Aunt Tiji, and she likes that. She is... Quebecese, Quebecese, although she lives in Toronto for over 30 years, her French-speaking mind still slips on occasion into the understanding of English sounds. And so, when she first heard of Hera Krishnas, she didn't hear right. She heard hairless Christians. And that is what they were to her for many years. When I corrected her, I told her that, in fact, she was not wrong. That Hindus, in their capacity for love, are indeed hairless Christians, just as Muslims, in the way they see God and everything, are bearded Hindus. And Christians and their devotion to God are hat wearing Muslims. And that's the end of chapter 16. Honestly, I took a religion class and a lot of this was like a repeat for me, but at the same time, I still don't understand Hinduism and this explanation did not help me at all. So, I'm going to pretend that this chapter didn't happen. You can analyze it all you want, but it's kind of just an explanation of how the religion works that he believes in, but it's Hinduism. And, um,. Yeah, he still has a deep respect for all religions, just kind of saying, hey, I'm Hindu. And that took an entire three pages to say for some reason. Anyways, moving on, chapter 17. Am I too mean to this book? Maybe. First wonder goes deepest. Wonder, after that fits an impression made by the first. I owe to Hinduism the original landscape of my religious imagination. Those towns and rivers, battlefields and forests, holy mountains and deep seas where gods, saints, villains, and ordinary people rub shoulders, and in doing so, define who and why we are. I first heard of a tremendous cosmic might of loving kindness in this Hindu land. It was Lord Krishna speaking. I heard him, and I followed him. And in his wisdom and perfect love, Lord Krishna led me to meet one man. I was fourteen years old, and well, content, content Hindu on holiday, when I met Jesus Christ. It was not often that Father took time off from the zoo, but one of the times he did, we went to Mon Manar, just over Kerala. Munner was a small hill station surrounded by some of your highest tea estates in the world. It was early May and then moon sun monsoon hadn't come yet. The plains of Tamil Nadu were beastly hot. We made it to Munner after a winding five hour car ride from Madurai. The coolness was as pleasing as having mint in your mouth. We did the tourist thing, we visited the Tata Tea Factory, we enjoyed a boat ride on the lake, we toured a cattle breeding center, we fed salt to some Nilgiri Tars, a species of wild goat in a national park. We have some in our zoo. You should come to Pondicherry, said Father to the Swiss tourists. Ravi and I went for walks in the tea estate near town. It was an excuse to keep our lethargy a little busy. 
By late afternoon, father and mother were settled in the tea room for our comfortable hotel as two cats sunning themselves at a window. Mother read while father chatted with a fellow guest. There are three hills within Munnar. They don't bear comparison with the tall hills, mountains you might call them, that surround the town, but I noticed the first morning that we were having breakfast that they did not stand out in one way. On each stood a godhouse. The hill on the right, across the river from the hotel, had a Hindu temple, high on its side. The hill in the middle, further away, held a mosque, while the hill on the left was crowned with a Christian church. On our fourth day in Manar, as the afternoon was coming to an end, I stood on the hill on the left. Despite attending a normally Christian school, I had yet not been inside a church, and I wanted... I wasn't about to dare the deed now. I knew very little about the religion. It had a reputation for few gods and great violence. But good schools... I walked around the church. It was a building unremittingly unrevealing of what it held inside, with thick featureless walls, pale blue in color and high, narrow windows impossible to look in through. A fortress. I came upon the rectory. The door was open. I hid around a corner to look upon the scene. To the left of the door was a small board with the words, Parish Priest and Assistant Priest on it. Next to each was a small sliding block. Both the priest and his assistant were in the board informed me in gold letters, which I could plainly see. One priest was working in his office, his back turned to the bay windows, while the other was seated on a bench at a round table in the large vestibule that have evidently functioned as a room for receiving visitors. He sat facing the door, and the windows and a book in his hands. A Bible, I presumed. He read a little, looked up and read a little more, looked up again. It was done in a way that was leisurely, yet alert, and composed. After some minutes, he closed the book and put it aside. He folded his hands together on the table and sat there, his expression serene, showing neither expectation nor resignation. The vestibule had clean, white walls. The table and benches were of dark wood, and the priest was dressed in a white cossack. It was all neat, plain, and simple. I was filled with a sense of peace, but more than the setting, what arrested me was my intuitive understanding that he was there, open, patient, in case someone, anyone, should want to talk to him. A problem of the soul, a heaviness of the heart, a darkness of the conscience. He would listen with love. He was a man whose profession was to love, and he would offer comfort and guidance to the best of his ability. I was moved. What I had before my eyes stole into my heart and thrilled me. He got up. I thought he might slide his block over, but he didn't. He retreated further into the rectory, and that's all, leaving the door between the vestibule and the next room as open as the outside door. I noted this, how both doors were wide open. Clearly, he and his colleague were still available. I walked away, and I dared. Oh, I walked away, and I dared. I entered the church. My stomach was in knots. I was terrified I would meet a Christian who would shout at me. What are you doing here? How dare you enter this sacred place, you defiler? Get out right now! There was no one. And little to be understood, I advanced and observed the inner sanctum. There was a painting. Was this the Murti? Something about human sacrifice? An angry god who had appeased with blood? Dazed women staring up at the air, fat bellies with tiny wings flying about? A charismatic bird? Which one was the god? To the side of the sanctum was a painted wooden sculpture. The victim again, bruised and bleeding in bold colors. I stared at his knees. They were badly scraped. The pink skin was peeled back and looked like petals of a flower, revealing the kneecaps that were fire engine red. It was hard to connect his torture scene with a priest in the rectory. The next day, at around the same time, I let myself in. Catholics have a reputation for severity for judgment that comes down heavily. My experience with Father Martin was not at all like that. He was very kind. He served me tea and biscuits in a tea set that tinkled and rattled at every touch. He treated me like a grown-up and told me a story. Or rather, since Christians are so fond of capital letters, a story with a capital S. I'm moving the camera because... The lighting keeps changing. Uh, It's not working. Anyways. And what a story. The first thing that drew me in was disbelief. What? Humanity sins, but it's God's son pays the price? I tried to imagine Father saying to me, Pasheen, a lion slipped into the llama pen today and I killed two llamas. Yesterday, another one killed a black buck. Last week, two of them ate the camel. The week before, it was painted storks and gray herons. And who's to say for sure who snacked our golden... Snacked on our golden ag- agouti? The situation had become intolerable. Something must be done. I've decided that the only way the lions can atone for their sins is if I feed you to them. Yes, Father, that would be the right and logical thing to do. Give me a moment to wash up. Hallelujah, my son. Hallelujah, Father. 
The way that read was just hilarious. What a downright weird story. What peculiar psychology. I asked for another story, one that I might find more satisfying. Surely this religion had more than one story in its bag. Religions abound with stories. But Father Martin made me understand that the stories that came before it, and they were many, were simply prologue to the Christians. Their religion had one story, and to it they came back again and again, over and over. It was a story enough for them. I was, it was quite, I was quiet that evening in the hotel. That's a god, that a god should put up with adversity I could understand. The gods of Hinduism face their fair share of thieves, bullies, kidnappers, and usurpers. What is the Ramaya but the account of one long, bad day for Rama? Adversity, yes. Reversals of fortune, yes. Treachery, yes. A humiliation? Death? I couldn't imagine Lord Krishna consenting to be stripped naked, whipped, mocked, dragged through the streets, and on top it off, crucified, and hands of mere humans to boot. I'd never heard of a Hindu god dying. Brahma revealed did not go for death. Devils and monsters did, as did mortals, by the thousands and millions. That's what we were there for. Matter, too, fell away. But divinity should be blighted by death. Should not be blighted by death. It's wrong. The, word, the world soul cannot die, even in one contained part of it. It was wrong of the Christian God to let his avatar die. That is a tantamount to learning a part of himself die. Oh, tenement. Nope, that's definitely tantamount. To letting a part of himself die. Or if the sun is to die, it cannot be fake. If God is on the cross, is God shamming a human tragedy, it turns out the passion of the Christ into the farce of Christ. The death of the sun must be real. Father Martin assured me that it was. But once a dead god, always a dead god, even resurrected. The sun must have a taste of death forever in his mouth. The trinity must be tainted by it, and there must be a certain stench at the right hand of God, the Father. The horror must be real. Why would God wish upon that wish that upon himself? Why not leave the death to the mortals? Why make dirty what is beautiful, spoil what is perfect? Love, that was Father Martin's answer. But what about the son's deportment? There's a story of baby There's a story of baby Krishna wrongly accused by his friends of eating a bit of dirt. His foster mother, Shoda, comes up to him with a wagging finger. You shouldn't eat dirt, you naughty boy, she scolds him. But I haven't, says the unchallenged lord of all, and everything in sport disguised as a frightened human child. Tut tut, open your mouth, or it is Yashoda. Krishna does as he is told. He opens his mouth. Yashoda gasps. She sees in Krishna's mouth the whole, complete, entire timeless universe, all the stars and planets of space and the distance between them, all the lands and the seas of earth and the life in them. She sees all the days of yesterday and all the days of tomorrow. She sees all ideas and all emotions, all pity and all hope, and the three strands of matter, not a pebble, candle, creature, village, or galaxy is missing, including herself and every bit of dirt in its truthful place. My lord, you can close your mouth, she says reverently. There's a story of Vishnu incarnated as Vamana the dwarf. He acts, asks of a demon king, Bali, only as much as land as he can cover in three strides. Bali laughs. In his runt of a suitor and a puny request, he consents. Immediately, Vishnu takes on his full cosmic side. With one stride, he covers the earth, and with a second, the heavens, and with a third, he boots Bali into the netherworld. That rude. Even Rama, the most human of avatars, who was to be reminded of his divinity when he grew long-faced over the struggle of, to get Sita, his wife, back from Ravana, evil king of Lanka, was no slouch. No spindly cross would have kept him down. When push came to shove, he transcended his limited human frame with strength no man could have and weapons no man could handle. That is God as God should be, with shine and power and might, such as can rescue and save and put down evil. This son, on the other hand, who goes hungry, who suffers from thirst, who gets tired, who is sad, who is anxious, who is heckled and harassed, who is put up with followers who don't get it and opponents who don't respect him. What kind of God is that? It is a God on too human a scale, that's what. There are miracles, yes, mostly of a medical nature. A few to satisfy hungry stomachs is the best a storm is tempered. Water is briefly walked upon. If that is magic, it is minor magic. On the order of card tricks, any Hindu god can do a hundred times better. This son is a god who spent most of his time telling stories, talking. The son is god who walked a pedestrian god in a hot place at that, with stride like any human stride, the sandals reaching just above the rocks along the way, and when he splurged on transportation, it was a regular donkey. This son is a god who died in three hours with moans, gasps, and laments. What kind of god is that? 
What is there to inspire in his son? Love, said Father Martin. And this son appears only once long ago, far away, among an obscure tribe of backwater of West Asia, on the confines of long-vanished empire. It is done away with before. It has a single gray hair on his head, leaves not a single descendant, only scattered particle testimony. His complete works doodles in the dirt. Wait a minute. That is more than Brahma with a serious case of stage fright. This is Brahman selfish. This is Brahman ungenerous and unfair. This is Brahman unpractically, practically unmanifest. If Brahman is to have only one son, he must be as abundant as Krishna, with milkmaids, no? What could justify such divine stinginess? Love, repeated Father Martin. I'll stick to my Krishna, thank you very much. I find his diversity, diversity utterly compelling. You can keep your sweaty, chatty son to yourself. That is how I met that troublesome rabbi of so long ago, the disbelief and honestness. And annoyance, sorry. I had tea with Father Martin three days in a row. Each time, his teacup rattled against saucer, his spoon tickled against edge of cup, I asked questions. The answer was always the same. He bothered me, this son. Every day I burned with greater indignation against him, found more flaws to him. He's petulant. It's morning at Bethany, and God is hungry. God wants his breakfast. He comes to a fig tree. It's not the season for figs, so the tree has no figs. God is peeved. The son mutters, May you never bear fruit again, and instantly the fig tree withers. So says Matthew, backed up by Mark. I ask you, is it the fig tree's fault that it is not the season for figs? What kind of thing is that to do to an innocent fig tree, whether wither it instantly? I couldn't get him out of my head. I still can't. I spent three solid days thinking about him. The more he bothered me, the less I could forget him. And more I learned about him, the less I wanted to leave him. On our last day, a few hours before we were to leave Munar, I hurried up the hill on the left. It strikes me how is how now as a typical Christian scene. Christianity is a religion in a rush. Look at the world created in seven days. Even on a symbolic level, that's creation in a frenzy. The one born in a religion where the battle for a single soul can be relay race run over many centuries with innumerable generations passing along the baton, the quick resolution of Christianity has a dizzying effect. If Hinduism flows placidly like the Ganges, and Christianity bustles like the Toronto at rush hour, like Toronto at rush hour, it is a religion as swift as swallow, as a swallow and as urgent as an ambulance. It turns on a dime, expresses itself in an instant. In a moment, you are either lost or saved. Christianity stretches back through the ages, but in essence it exists only at one time, right now. I booted up that hill. Though Father Martin was not in... Alas, bl alas, his block was slid over. Thank God he was in. Short of breath, I said, Father, I would like to be a Christian, please. He smiled. You already are, Piscine, in your heart. Whatever meets Christ, in whoever meets Christ in good faith is a Christian. Here, Minar, you meet Christ. You met Christ. He patted me on the head. It was more of a thump, actually. His hand went boom, boom, boom on my head. I thought I would explode with joy. When you come back, we'll have tea again, my son. Yes, Father. It was a good smile he gave me, the smile of Christ. I entered the church without fear this time, for it was now my house too. I offered prayers to Christ who is alive. Then I raced down the hill on the left and raced up the hill on the right to offer thanks to my Lord Krishna for having put Jesus of Nazareth, whose humanity I found so compelling, in my way. Now that's an interesting chapter. Uh, so chapter 17 was about how he is a Hindu, but he not converts, but becomes Christian also. He thinks that there is an acceptance of all religions within Hinduism and that both can exist at the same time. And Krishna put Jesus in the path of Pi, which is an interesting thought. And so I'm not going to explain how Christianity works. Bottom line is uh, the answer to every question that Pi asked was uh, to why all the things in the Bible are the way they are. It's because of love. And so um, Pi is kind of taken aback, and he really enjoys the idea that all of this is a very, like, humble, down-to-earth kind of religion where everything is happening so quickly. Um, he just kind of gets swept up, and he's like, I kind of want to be a Christian. So he goes to the Father, and he's like, hey, can I be a Christian? And the Father's like, well, you are a Christian. He's like, what? And he's like, well, you greeted God or Jesus with your with an open heart and, like, without with grace, graciousness, and so you're a Christian. That's it. And so he was overjoyed, and he's like, yeah, I'm Christian. And that's that's the end of that chapter. So maybe he will also become Muslim or something uh, as to, like, fully encompass 
more religions and like show that he is like why he's a religious studies minor major double major with zoology i don't know anyways so that's that's we'll see where all that leads maybe there's another religion gonna get involved but that's all the time i have for now so thanks for joining me i'll catch you in the next chapters goodbye Welcome back, I'm Micah Reads, and today we are going to be reading Life of Pi, Chapter 18, for sure, maybe more. So, first thing you'll notice right over here is going to be my brand new logo. Somebody was like, hey, you should make a new logo because you have a fox in your intro, and so now my intro, has, my, my logo has a fox. Not much take to inspire me. It took like 10 minutes to make. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So, let's get rolling into chapter 18. Oh, let me know how you like the logo. If you don't like it, I mean, again, it only took 10 minutes. I can make it nothing again. <clears throat> Islam followed right behind, hardly a year later. As I predicted, by the way. He was going to get into three religions, at least, and Islam had to be a third. I was 15 years old, and I was exploring my hometown. The Muslim quarter wasn't far from the zoo. A small, quiet neighborhood with Arabic writing and crescent moons inscribed on the facades of the houses. I came to Mullah Street. I had a peek at the Jamai Masjid, the great mosque, being careful to stay on the outside, of course. Islam had a ha reputation worse than Christianity's. Fewer gods, greater violence, and I had never heard anyone say good things about Muslim schools. I wasn't about to step in empty through the place, though the place was. The building, clean and white except for various edges painted green, was an open construction, unfolding around an empty central room. Long, straw mats covered the floor everywhere. Above, two slim, fluted marionettes rose in the air before the background of soaring coconut trees. There was nothing evidently religious or, for that matter, interesting about the place, but it was pleasant and quiet. I moved on. Just beyond the mosque was a series of attached single-story dwellings with small, shaded porches. They were run down and poor, but their stucco walls of faded green. One of the village, the dwellings was a small shop. I noticed a rack of dusty bottles of the thumb, thumbs up of the four transparent plastic jars, half full of candies. But the main ware was something else, something flat, roundish and white. I got close. It seemed to be some sort of unleavened bread. I poked at one. I flipped it stiffly. It looked like three-day-old nons. Who would eat these, I wondered. I picked one up and wagged it to see if it would break. A voice said, Would you like to taste one? I nearly jumped out of my skin. It's happened to all of us. There's sunlight and shade and spots and patterns of color. Your mind is elsewhere, so you don't make out what's right in front of you. Not four feet away, sitting cross-legged before his breads, was a man. I was so startled, my hand flew up and the bread went sailing halfway across the street. It landed on a pad of fresh cow dung. I'm so sorry, sir. I didn't see you, I burst out. I was just ready to run away. Don't worry, he said calmly. It will feed a cow. Have another one. He tore one in two. We ate it together. It was tough and rubbery. Real work for the teeth, but filling. I calmed down. So you make these, I said, to make conversation. Yes. Here, let me show you how. He got off his platform and waved me into, the ha into his house. In America, that stuff would not fly. You're not going to wave some child into your house without, like, you know, the police called on you. Anyways, moving on. It was a two-room hovel. The larger room, dominated by an oven, was a bakery, and the other, separated by a flimsy curtain, was his bedroom. The bottom of the oven was covered with smooth pebbles. He was explaining to me how the bread baked on these heated pebbles when the nasal cowl of the muezzin wafted through the air from the mosque. I knew it was a call to prayer. I didn't know what it entailed. I imagined it beckoned the Muslim faith to the mosque, much like bells summoned us Christians to church. Not so. The baker interrupted himself mid-sentence and said, Excuse me. He ducked into the next room for a minute and returned with a rolled-up carpet, which he unfurled on the floor of his bakery, <clears throat> throwing up a small storm of flour, and there, right there before me, in the midst of his workplace, he prayed. It was incongruous, but it was I who felt out of place. Luckily, he prayed with his eyes closed. He stood straight. He muttered in Arabic. 
He brought his hands to his ears, thumbs touching the lobes, looking as if he were straining to hear Allah replying. He bent forward. He stood straight again. He fell to his knees and brought his hands and forehead to the floor. He sat up. He fell forward again. He stood. He started the whole thing again. Why? Islam is nothing but an easy sort of exercise, I thought. Aunt weather yoga for the Boudouins. Asans without sweat. Heaven without strain. He went through the cycle four times, muttering throughout. When he had finished, there was a right-left turning of the head and a short bout of med meditation. He opened his eyes, smiled, stepped off his carpet, and rolled it with a flick of the hand that spoke of old habit. He returned it to its spot in the next room. He came back to me. What was I saying, he said. So it was the first time I saw a Muslim pray. Quite, necess quite necessar necessary, physical, muttered, striking. Next time I was praying in church on my knees, immobile, silent, for, before Christ on the cross, the image of this calisthenic communion with God in the middle of a bags of flour kept coming to my mind. And that was the end of chapter 18. So in this chapter, uh, he was just wandering about his town, and he ran into, like, the Muslim district. So he wanders around the Muslim district, and he's like, this church doesn't really look like a, like a standard kind of church. And then he sees some small buildings, and there's, like, bread in front of one of the buildings. He's like, oh, it's probably a shop. So he walks over to that shop, and he's like, hmm, what kind of bread is this? And it's, like, really thin and rubbery. And all of a sudden, there's a guy apparently sitting right in front of him that he didn't notice, and he just says, hey, what's up? You want to taste that bread? And he's like, whoa, and he threw his bread behind him and landed in cow poop. And so... Uh, he starts talking to the guy, and the guy's like, hey, let me show you how to make this bread. And after he shared some with him, and he tasted it, he's like, oh, this is rubbery. And so he goes into this stranger's house, which, again, would not fly. Um, you know, in America, you don't go into strangers' houses unless they have candy. He's just showing you how to make bread. It's super creepy. Anyways, moving on. Um, so he goes into there, and the guy's like, oh, let me show you how to make this bread. And then all of a sudden, the bells for prayer start signing. And rather than the guy going to church or something like uh, Pi expects, the guy literally just grabs, like, the roll-up carpet thing that Muslims use, rolls it out onto the floor, and just starts praying right there on the floor of his bakery. And so Pi is like, whoa, that's weird. But then as he's, like, he finishes up with the, like, seeing how to bread's made, they kind of skip over it, and he goes to, like, church later. And as he's sitting there, like, completely, like, straight and praying to God, he's like, that's weird. Because he can't stop thinking about, like, the way the pro the Muslims pray, how it's so, like, active and, like, devoted. And so maybe we'll see more of that, like, shown through his life. He's He likes the commitment that is entailed with Islam. So anyways, moving on to the next chapter. <clears throat> chapter 19. I went to see him again. What's your religion about, I asked. His eyes lit up. It's about the beloved, he replied. I challenged anyone to understand Islam, its spirit, and not to love it. It is a beautiful religion of brotherhood and devotion. The mosque was truly an open construction to God, and a breeze. We sat cross-legged, listening to Imam until the time came to pray. Then, the random pattern of sisters disappeared as we stood and arranged ourselves shoulder to shoulder, in rows, every space ahead being filled by somebody from behind, until every line was solid. We were row after row of worshippers. It felt good to bring my forehead to the ground. Immediately, it felt like, it felt like a deeply religious... Contact. <clears throat> that was the end of that chapter. So he went into a Muslim church, I can't remember what they're called, and started praying with the Muslims. It's he's just he's really moving into every single religion, uh, getting a taste of it all. And that was my cat running by, by the way. You probably saw her fur dripping from the sky. <sighs> Anyways, moving on to chapter twenty. He was a Sufi, a Muslim mystic. He sought Fana, union with God, and his relationship with God was personal and loving. If you take two steps towards God, he used to tell me, God runs to you. He's a very plain-featured man, with nothing in his looks or in his dress that made the memory hark. I'm not surprised I didn't see him the first time we met. Even when I knew him very well, encounter after encounter, I had difficulty recognizing him. His name was Satish, Satish Kumar. There are common names in Tamil Nudu, so the coincidence is not so remarkable. Still, it pleased me to, that this pious baker has to explain a shadow and a solid health and the communist bio biology teacher and, and science devotee and the walking mountain on stilts, sadly afflicted with polio in his childhood, carried the same name. Mr. and Mr. Kumar taught me biology and Islam. Mr. and Mr. Kumar led me to the study of zoology and religious studies at the University of Toronto. Mr. and Mr. Kumar were the prophets of my Indian youth. 
We prayed together, and we practiced a kir, the recitation of ninety-nine revealed names of God. He was a hafiz, one who knows the Quran by heart. And he sang in a slow, simple chant. My Arabic was never very good, but I loved its sound. The guttural eruptions and long, flowing vowels rolled just beneath the comprehension like a beautiful brook. I gazed into this book for a long spells of time. It was not wide, just one man's voice, but it was deep as the universe. I described Mr. Kumar's place as a hovel, yet no mosque, church, or temple ever seemed, to si- seemed so sacred to me. <laughs> I sometimes came out of that bakery feeling heavy with glory. I would climb onto my bicycle and pedal that glory through the air. One such time, I left town, and on my way back, at a point where the land was so high and I could see the sea to my left and down the road a long ways, I suddenly felt I was in heaven. The spot was, in fact, no different from when I had passed it not long before. But my way of seeing it had changed. The feeling of paradoxical mix of pulsing energy and profound peace was so intense and blissful. Whereas before the road, the sea, the trees, and the air, the sun all spoke differently to me. Now they spoke one language of unity. Tree took account of road, which was aware of air, which was mindful of sea, which shared things with the sun. Every element lived in harmonious relation with its neighbor, and all was kith and kin. I knelt to mortal. I rose immortal. I felt the center of a small circle coinciding with the center of a much larger one. Atman met Allah. One time after I felt God was ca- came so close to me, I was in Canada so much later. I was visiting friends in the country. It was winter. I was alone on walk with their large property and returning to the house. It was clear, sunny day after a night of snowfall. All nature was blanketed in white. As I was coming up to the house, I turned my head, and there was a wood in that wood, a small clearing. A breeze, or perhaps it was an animal, had shaken a branch. Fine snow was falling through the air, glittering in the sunlight. In that fallen golden dust, in the sun-splashed clearing, I saw the Virgin Mary. Why her? I don't know. My devotation to Mary was secondary, but it was her. Her skin was pale, she was wearing a white dress and a blue cloak. I remember being struck by the pleats in the folds. When I say I saw her, I don't mean quite literally, though she did have body and color. I felt I saw her, a vision beyond a vision. I stopped and squinted. She looked beautiful and and supremely regal. She was smiling at me with loving kindness. After some seconds, she left me. My heart beat with fear and joy. The presence of God in his finest of rewards. And that's the end of chapter 20. So, what happened in this chapter is he was hanging out. Uh, with all of the Muslims learning the ways of Islam, and he really likes the way it's the way the language is formed, uh, Arabic, and he likes kind of how the whole Quran is put in place. And so he finds a joining between the three religions he has. He has his Christianity, he has Hinduism, and he has Islam. And so he's joining them all together, and he feels like a very heavenly kind of connection between all the things, the land, the sea, the air, everything kind of comes together. And at one point in his life, he says later in life when he's in Canada, that when, like, snow started falling between, like, the branches after something had rustled the branches, he kind of felt that he saw the Virgin Mary. Yeah. And she had just kind of given him, like, a terrified but, like, glorious feeling when he saw her, saw her. And so it kind of changed him in a way, but I think all of this is still leading up to something else. So, I, again, the book is very much about religion, but there's a lot of other stuff that it has to, like, pack in there. So you understand the kind of person Pi is and the struggles he's going to have to deal with throughout his life. So, moving on, I think we're actually done with our this this video in particular. 13 minutes is kind of short, but eh, we, we packed a bunch in. So, thank you so much for joining me. Sorry my cat interrupted a couple times, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. All right, bye. Welcome back, I'm Michael Reeds, and once again, we are going to be hopping right back into Life of Pi by Jan Martel. We're going to be doing chapters 21 to like 26. It's going to be like a good, solid, lots of reading all packed into one. So don't let me waste your time. And again, since we have a new logo hiding out right over here, let me know what you think of it. If you hate it, I can remove it. 
well, I can't remove it after this is already up. But in future ones, I can get rid of it. So, you know, give me a response quick. Otherwise, these videos will be low good forever because, you know, time crunches and all that. Anyways, chapter 21, huh? Yeah. <clears throat> chapter 21. I'm sitting in a downtown cafe after thinking... I've just spent most of an afternoon with him. Our encounters always leave me wary of the glum contentment that characterizes my life. What were those words he used that struck me? Ah, yes. Dry, yeastless factuality. The better story. I take pen and paper out and write. Words of divine consciousness, moral exaltation, lasting feelings of elevation, elation, joy... A quickened of the moral sense which strikens one with more important than the intellectual understanding of things. An alignment of the universe along moral lines, not intellectual ones. And a realization that the, founda the founding principle of existence is what we love, which works itself out sometimes, not clearly, not cleanly, not immediately, nonetheless, ineluctably. I pause. What if God's silence? I think it over. I add... An intellect confounded, yet a trusting sense of presence and of ultimate purpose. And that's the end of chapter one. Again, this is kind of like a review of present day stuff happening. It's kind of like a reporter or something like who has just talked to Pi and is repeating back in kind of a way what has just happened in that conversation. And so they discussed God, I think, in this one. And I don't know. Uh, the f it's just basically... The bottom line is the founding principle of life is love. The importance of life. The meaning of life is love. So follow things you love, basically. At least that's what I think I got from that chapter. Anyways, chapter 22, right? I can well imagine an atheist's last words. White, white, l l love, my God, and the deathbed leap of faith. Whereas the agnostic, if he stays true to his reasonable self, if he stays beholden to dry, useless factuality might try to explain the warm light bathing him by saying, possibly f failing oxygen of the b brain, and the very lack of imagination, and miss the better story. And that's the end of chapter 22. <clears throat> so basically, it states that um, an atheist's last words, essentially, he sees like a white light as he's dying, and he's like, oh, maybe there is a god. All this doubt that I have is completely unbased, because I didn't think there was actually like a like a bathing glow of light, and now I can completely switch sides, because really I had no proof, and now I have proof. But then the uh, agnostic would say, because agnostics are essentially doubtful, they don't believe in anything, and if they do believe in something, then they doubt it and they criticize it, at least in Pi's mind, is that when they see the light at the end of their life, they think it's failing oxygen to the brain. So, whereas atheists are like akin to believe either something or nothing based on evidence, agnostics always like half believe things because they're mistrusting. I'm not going to over-explain this. Anyways, chapter 23. Alas the, sen alas, the sense of community that common faith brings to people. It spelled trouble for me. In time, my religious doings went from the notice of those to whom it didn't matter and only amused to that of those to whom it did matter, and they were not amused. What is your son doing going to temple? asked the priest. Your son was seen in church crossing himself, said the imam. Your son has gone to Islam, said the pandit. Yes, it was all forcefully brought to the attention of my bemused parents. You see, they didn't know. They didn't know that I was a practicing Hindu, Christian, and Muslim. Teenagers always hide a few things from their parents, isn't that so? All 16-year-olds have secrets, don't they? But fate decided that my parents and I, and the three wise men, as I shall call them, should meet one day on the Gobert Salai Seaside Esplande, and my secret should be outed. It was a lovely, breezy, hot Sunday afternoon, and the Bay of Bengal glittered under blue sky. Townspeople were out for a stroll. Children screamed and laughed. Colored balloons floated in the air. Ice cream sales were brisk. Why think of business on such a day, I ask? Why couldn't they just have walked by with a nod and a smile? It was not to be. We were to meet not just one wise man, but all three, and not one after another, but at the same time, and each would decide upon seeing us right then was the golden occasion to meet that Pondicherry notable, the zoo director. He of the model devout son. When I saw the first, I smiled. By the time I had laid on the third, my smile had frozen into a mask of horror. When it was clear that all three were converging on us, my heart jumped before sinking very low. The wise men seemed annoyed when they realized that all three of them were approaching the same people. 
Each must have assumed that the others were there for some business other than pastoral, and had rudely, rudely chosen the moment to deal with it. Glances of displeasure were exchanged. My parents looked puzzled to have their way gently blocked by three broadly smiling religious strangers. I should explain that my family was anything but orthodox. Father saw himself as part of the new India, rich, modern, and secular as ice cream. He didn't have a religious bone in his body. He was a businessman, pronounced busyness man, in his case, a hard-working, earthbound professional, more concerned with inbreeding among the lions than of any other or arching moral or existential scheme. It's true that he had all the animals blessed by a priest, and there were two small shrines at the zoo, one to Lord Ganesh and one to Hanuman, God's unlikely to please a zoo director, but with the first having the head of an elephant and the second being a monkey. But Father's calculation was that this was good for business. Not good for a soul, a matter of public relations rather than personal salvation. Spiritual worry was alien to him. It was a financial worry that rocked his being. One epidemic in the collection, he used to say. And we end up in a road crew, breaking up stones. Mother was mum, bored and neutral on the subject. A Hindu upbringing and a Baptist education had precisely cancelled each other out as far as religion was concerned, and had left her ser serenely impious. I suspect that she suspected I had a different take on the matter, but she never said anything when I was a child. I devoured the comic books of Ramayana and the Mahabharata and illustrious children's Bible and other stories of the gods. She herself was a big reader. She was pleased to see me with my nose buried in a book, any book, so long as it wasn't naughty. As for Ravi, if Lord Krishna had held a cricket bat rather than a flute, if Christ had appeared more plainly to him as an umpire, if Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had shown some notions of bowling, he might have lifted a religious eyelid, but they didn't, so he slumbered. After the hellos and the good days, there was an awkward silence. A priest broke it, and he said, with pride in his voice, Machine, it's good, it is a good Christian boy. I hope to see him join our choir soon. My parents, the pandit, and the imam looked surprised. You must be mistaken. He's a good Muslim boy. He comes without fail to Friday prayer, and his knowledge of the Holy Quran is coming along nicely, said the imam. My parents, the priest, and the pandit looked incredulous. The pandit spoke. You're both wrong. He's a good Hindu boy. I see him all the time, the temple coming for Dashan and per performing puja. My parents, the imam, and the priest looked astonished. <laughs> there is no mistake, said the priest. I know this boy. He is Pashin Molotar Patal, and he is Christian. I know him too, and I tell you he's Muslim, said the imam. Nonsense, cried the pandit. Pashin is born a Hindu, lives a Hindu, and will die a Hindu. The three wise men stared at each other, breathless and disbelieving. Lord, avert their eyes from me, I whispered in my soul. All eyes fell upon me. Pashin, can this be true? asked the imam earnestly. Hindus, Christians, are adult adulterers. They have many gods, and Muslims have many wives, responded the pandit. A priest looked askance at both of them. Pashin, he nearly whispered, there's salvation only in Jesus. Balderdash, Christians know nothing about religion, said the pandit. They strayed long ago from God's path, said the imam. Where's God in your religion, snapped the priest. You don't have a single miracle to show for it. What kind of religion is that, without miracles? It isn't a circus with dead people jumping out of tombs all the time, that's what. We Muslims stick to the essential miracle of existence. Birds flying, rain falling, crops growing. These are miracles enough for us. Feathers and rain are all very nice, but we like to know that God is truly with us. Is that so? Well, a whole lot of good it did God to be with you. You tried to kill him. You banged him into a cross with big, great big nails. Is that a civilized way to treat a prophet? The prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, brought us the word of God without any undignified nonsense and died at ripe old age. The word of God? To that illiterate merchant of yours in the middle of a desert? Those were drooling epileptic fits beyond on the way, swaying on his camel, not divine re revelation. That or the sun frying his brains. If the prophet, prophet PBUH, were alive, praise be upon him, yeah, praise be upon him, he would have a choice words for you, replied the imam with narrowed eyes. Well, he's not. Christ is alive. Well, your old PBUH is dead. 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 The pandit interrupted them quietly. In Tamil, he said, the real question is, why is Pasheen dallying with all these foreign religions? The eyes of the priest and the imam properly popped out of their heads. They were both native Tamils. God is universal, sputtered the priest. Imam nodded strong approval. There is only one God. 
And with the one God, Muslims are always causing troubles and provoking riots. The proof of how bad Islam is is how uncivilized Muslims are. Pronounced the pandit. Says the slave driver of the caste system, Huff the Imam. Hindus enslave people and worship dressed up dolls. They are golden calf lovers. They kneel before cows, the priest chimed in. While Christians kneel before a white man, they are flunkies of a foreign god. They are the nightmare of non-white people. And they eat pigs and are cannibals, added the imam for good measure. What it comes down to, the priest put out with cool rage, is whether Pasheen wants a real religion or myths from a cartoon strip. God or idols, intoned the imam gravely. Our gods or colonial gods, hissed the pandit. It was hard to tell whose face was more inflamed. It looked as if they might come to blows. Father raised his hands. Gentlemen, gentlemen, please, he interjected. I would like to remind you there is freedom of practice in this country. Three epileptic faces turned to him. Yes, practice, singular, the wise men screamed in unison. Three index fingers, like punctuation marks, jumped to attention in the air to emphasize their point. They were not pleased at the unintended, unintended choral effect of their spontaneous unity in their gestures. Their fingers came down quickly, and they sighed and groaned at each other, each on his own. Father and mother stared on at a loss for words. The pandit spoke first. Mr. Patel, Pasheen's piety is admirable. In these troubled times, it's good to see a boy so keen on God. We all agree on that. The imam and the priest nodded. But he can't be a Hindu, a Christian, and a Muslim. It's impossible. He must choose. I don't think it's a crime, but I suppose you're right, father replied. Three murmured in agreement and looked heavenward, as did, the fa as did father, whence they felt the decision must come. Mother looked at me. A silence fell heavily on my shoulders. Hmm, Pasheen? Mother nudged me. How do you feel about the question? Bapu Gandhi said all religions are true, and if I want to love God, I blurted out, and I looked down, red in the face. My embarrassment was contagious. No one said anything. It happened that we were not far from the statue of Gandhi on his espl espina esplanade. esplanade, that's a hard word, stick in hand, an impish smile on his lips, a twinkle in his eyes, and Mah Mahatma walked. I fancy that he heard our conversation, but that he paid even greater attention to my heart. Father cleared his throat, and in his half-voice, I suppose that's what we're all trying to do. Love God. I thought it very funny that he should say that. He, who hadn't stepped into a temple with serious intents inside the faculty of memory. But it seemed to do the trick. You can't reprimand a boy for wanting to love God. The three wise men pulled away with stiff, grudging smiles on their faces. Father looked at me for a second, as if to speak, and then thought better and said, Ice cream, anyone? He headed for the closest ice cream wallow. Before we could answer, Mother gazed at me a little longer with an expression that both tender and perplexed. That was my introduction to the interfaith dialogue. Father brought three ice cream sandwiches. We ate them in un unusual silence as we continued our Sunday walk. And that is the end of chapter 23. So, lot to unpack here. I was hanging out with his family. They were by the water. And he runs into all three of his prophets, I guess they are, to him. Uh, that of Islam, Hinduism, and Christianity. And they all walk up at the exact same time. They're like, wait a minute. Kind of like Three Stooges moment. And all of them start talking about how he's like, he comes to my church all the time. And the uh, Muslim priest is like, he's always coming to my services. And the Hindu guy is like, and he always knows everything that he needs to know for, his re for my religion. And so they're all like, well, if he's good to all of us, I don't really understand. He has to pick one. He can't just be like, involved in all three religions, there's conflicts here. This person's like, blah, 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 saying nasty things about each other. Details aren't really important. Uh, so anyways, uh, they're all like bad-mouthing each other, and they're like, listen, Pi, you have to pick. You can't just say all religions. You can't just believe in all three of our religions. Like, you have to pick one. And so his dad kind of comes... Well, no, he kind of saves himself here. He's, he's smart enough to fix this himself. And so he says, doesn't Gandhi say that all religions are true? And everybody's like... I guess. And so they all kind of like are weirded there. But like if we back up a little bit, his mother, I think is he never really talks about his mother. And like he can claim many things about that. Like you could say it's like Nah, let's not go there. Uh so basically <laughs> I was gonna go like it's kind of sexist that they don't mention any female characters in this book really, but that's not really an issue that needs to be addressed because it's not relevant to the book. So anyways, so we get some knowledge on his mom. His mom kind of like 
has two religions from her childhood that clash with each other, and so she kind of has like a completely neutral view on religion, and so she kind of just pops her head in there and is like, oh, you really should, should pick one. Like, she's almost like instigating the whole like fight just to like, yeah, I guess he does need to pick one. I pick one. And he's like, uh, but then he says the Gandhi thing and then everybody's disappointed. His dad's like, how about we all just get ice cream? So he gets ice cream and they all just kind of separate. And that was that. So it was kind of an awkward interaction between all of them, but it's kind of like a, a begrudging acceptance that Pi's just gonna have Pi's just gonna continue doing whatever he does, and he's just gonna believe in all three religions, and they can't do anything about that. Anyway, so let's just keep on trucking because we still got like three more chapters. <clears throat> Chapter twenty-four. Ravi had a field day of it when he found out. So, Swami Jesus, will you go to the Haji this year? He said, bringing the palms of his hand together in front of his face in a reverent namaskar. Does Me- does Mecca beckon? He crossed himself. Or will it be to Rome for your coronation as the next Pope Pius? He drew in the air a Greek letter, making clear the spelling of his mockery. Have you find, found time yet at the end of your pecker cutoff and to become a Jew? At the rate you're going, if you go to temple on Thursday, mosque on Friday, synagogue on Saturday, and church on Sunday, you only need to convert to three more religions on, to be on a holiday for the rest of your life. Another lampoonery of such kind. I mean, that's the end of chapter 24. It was really just his brother, Ravi, mocking him for believing in multiple religions. Anyways, chapter 25. And that wasn't the end of it. There are always those who take it upon themselves to defend God, as if the ultimate reality, as if the sustaining frame of existence, were something weak and helpless. These people walk by a window, deformed by leprosy, begging for new, for a few pays, walk by, children dressed in rags, living in the street, and they think, business as usual. But if they perceive the slight against God, it is in a different story. Their faces go red, their chests heave mightily, they sputter angry words. The degree in which their indignation is astonishing. Their resolve is frightening. These people fail to realize that it's on the inside that God must be defended, not on the outside. They should direct their anger at themselves. For evil in the open is but evil within that has been let out. Main battlefield for good is not the open ground at the public arena, but the small clearing of each heart. Meanwhile, the lot of windows and homeless children is very hard, is very, yeah, is very hard, and it's their defense, not God's. That is the self-righteous, the self-righteous, <laughs> righteous should rush. Once an oaf chased me away from the great mosque. When I went to church, the priest glared at me so that I could not feel the peace of Christ. A Brahmin sometimes shooed me away from Durshan. My religion, do- my religious doings were reported to my parents in the hushed, urgent tones of treason revealed. As if this small-mindedness did God any good. To me, religion was about dignity, not depravity. I stopped attending Mass at Our Lady of Immaculate Conception, and went instead to Our Lady of Angels. I no longer lingered after Friday prayer among my brethren. I went to temple at crowded times when Brahmins were too distracted to come between God and me. And so, we see here that uh, Pai is being like discriminated against for believing in multiple religions and going to all their ceremonies. At each ceremony, he feels that He's kind of being, like, pushed out by people. And any time he goes to a different one, people, like, go to his parents and they're like, hey, he's been going to this religion. Like, it's some big secret. And it's kind of, he also, like, shuns people who ignore, like, homeless children and, like, depravity in the world. And he's like, why are you fighting, like, for your God so much? God is, like, inside you. Like, you don't have to fight anything externally. Like, God will find himself in people if you want to, like, do good things, if you want to, like, make the world a better place, you won't do that by, like, arguing against people's religion. You'll do that by helping, like, homeless people. You'll be beating the poor. Like, you'll be doing, like, active things to make the world better and not just yelling about how good God is. You're not showing anyone how good God is. You're just doing nothing. <laughs> so, anyways, Pi kind of works around this by avoiding times in which there will be conflict with people. Anyways... We are on our last chapter of the day, which is chapter 26. A few days after the meeting on the Espelande, I took my courage into the hands to see Father at his office. Father? Yes, Pasheen. I'd like to be baptized, and I would like a prayer rug. My words intruded slowly. He looked up from his papers after some seconds. A what? What? I'd like to pray outside without getting my pants dirty, and I'm attending a Christian school without having received the proper baptism of Christ. Why do you want to pray outside? In fact, why do you want to pray at all? Because I love God. Aha. 
He seemed taken aback by my answer, nearly embarrassed by it. There was a pause. I thought he was going to offer me ice cream again. Well, Petite Seminary is Christian only in name. There are many Hindu boys who aren't Christians. You'll get just as good an education without being baptized. Praying to Allah won't make any difference either. But I want to pray to Allah. I want to be a Christian. Can't be both. You must either be either one or the other. Why can't I be both? They're separate religions. They have nothing in common. That's not what they say. They both claim Abraham is theirs. Muslims say God of the Hebrews and Christians is the same as the God of Muslim. They recognize David, Moses, and Jesus as prophets. What does that have to do with us, Pasheen? We're Indians. There have been Christians and Muslims in India for centuries. Some people say Jesus is buried in Kashmir. He says nothing, only looked at me, his brow furrowed. Suddenly, business called. Talk to Mother about it. He was reading. Mother? Yes, darling. I'd like to be baptized, and I would like a prayer rug. Talk to Father about it. I did. He told me to talk to you about it. Did he? He laid her book down. She looked out at the direction of the zoo. At that moment, I'm sure Father felt a blow of chill air across the back of his neck. He turned to the bookshelf. I have a book here that you'll like. She already had her arm out reaching for a volume. It was Robert Louis Stevenson. This was her usual tactic. I've already read that, Mother, three times. Oh. Her arm hovered to the left. The same with Conan Doyle, I said. Her arm swung to the right. R.K. Narayan. You can't possibly have read all of Narayan. Those matters are important to me, Mother. Robinson Crusoe! Mother. But Pasheen, she said. She settled back into her chair, a path of least resistance look on her face, which meant I had to put up a stiff fight, but in precisely the right spots. She adjusted in cushion. Father and I find your religious zeal a bit of a mystery. It is a mystery. Hmm. I don't mean it that way. Listen, my darling. If you're going to be religious, you must either a Hindu, Christian, or a Muslim. You heard what they said on the Esplande. I don't see why I can't be all three. Mamaji has two passports. He's Indian and French. Why can't I be Hindu, Christian, and Muslim? That's different. France and India are nations on Earth. How many nations are there in the sky? She thought for a second. One. That's the point. One nation, one passport. One nation in the sky? Yes, or none. There's an option, too, you know. These are terribly old-fashioned things you've taken to. If there's only one nation in the sky, shouldn't all passports be valid for it? A cloud of uncertainty came over her face. Bapu Gandhi said, I know what Bapu Gandhi said. She found a hand to her forehead. She had a very weary look. Mother did. Good grief, she said. So what happened in this chapter, and this is the last chapter that I'm reading today. Uh, so what happened in this chapter was... He said he wants to be baptized uh, for Christianity and that he wants to get a prayer rug for whenever he's praying outside. And so he goes to his dad to ask for both of these things, as a kid would. And his dad's like, can't you not? <laughs> like, you have to pick a religion. And this is the same, you know, argument that's been going on for like the last two chapters. He's like, no, I don't want to pick a religion. I want them all. And his dad's like, I'm not going to have this conversation with you. Just talk to your mother about it. She'll figure it out. And so he goes to his mother, and his mom's like, well, she's exactly the same. She's like, her, she's kind of deflect, too. She says, how about you just read something? I have books right here. This is, and he's like, I already read that. And she's like, what about this? But he's like, I already read that. And he's like, Robinson Crusoe. And he's like, I already read that. And so he's read all the books there, because I'm sure he's been deflected a couple times by his parents. Um, and he says to mom, well, he just has a discussion with his mom about how he can be all three, and she's like, you can't be all three, and she's, he's like, well, how many passports are there in heaven, because people can have multiple passports, you can have dual citizenship between multiple countries, she's like, there's one passport to the sky, and he's like, there's only one passport to the sky, doesn't that mean any of the passports you get from any of the religions will get you there, and so his mentality is, all three passports will get him into heaven, or whatever is in the sky, so it doesn't matter which one he has, or if he has all three, because no matter what, he's still going to be getting in, he just has three different ways to do it now. And so his mom just kind of like gives up there and I'm sure he's going to get his baptism and prayer rug. But anyways, that's the end of chapter 26. Yeah, cool. So thanks for joining me guys. You guys were super cool to sit through all those chapters 21 to 26. That's like five chapters of math. And so anyways, we're done. Thanks. Cool. Uh, I'll catch you in the next video. Goodbye. <laughs>
Welcome back. I'm Micah Reeds, and we're going to be reading Life of Pi by Jan Martell. Heads up, I'm a, a teensy weensy bit sick, so if my voice starts breaking down and I start coughing, maybe you'll see a cut, or maybe I'll just cough and you'll have to watch me die here. Anyways, so uh, we're on chapter 27 of Life of Pi, like I said, and I think I'm just going to jump right into it. This is going to be multi-chaptered, as most of my videos are, as you can probably tell from the description. Cool? Cool. All right, chapter 27. Later that evening, I overheard my parents speaking. You said yes, said father. I believe he asked you too. You referred him to me, replied mother. Did I? You did. I had a very busy day. You're not busy now. You're quite comfortably unemployed by the looks of it. If you want to march into his room and pull the prayer rug from under his feet and discuss the question of Christian baptism with him, please go ahead. I won't object. <clears throat> no, no, I could tell from the voice... From his voice, the father was settling deeper into his chair. There was a pause. He seems to be attracting religions the way a dog attracts fleas, he pursued. I don't understand it. We're a modern Indian family. We live in a modern way. India is on the cusp of becoming truly modern and advanced nation. And here we've produced a son who thinks he's a reincarnation of Sri Makshran Krishna. <clears throat> if Miss Gandhi, if Mr. Yeah, Mrs. Gandhi is what being modern and advanced is about, I'm not sure I like it. Mother said. Oh, I don't understand what that means at all. Mrs. Gandhi will pass. Progress is unstoppable. It is a drumbeat to which we all march. <clears throat> technology helps, and as good ideas spread, these two laws of nature. If you don't let technology help you, if you insist good ideas, you condemn yourself to dinosaurhood. I'm utterly convinced of this, Mrs. Gandhi, and all her foolishness will pass. The new India will come. Indeed, she would pass. A new India, or one family of it, would decide to move to Canada. Father went on. Did you hear what he said? Bapu Gandhi said, All religions are true. Yes. Bapu Gandhi. The boy is going to be in affectionate terms with Gandhi. After Daddy Gandhi, what next? Uncle Jesus? And what's this nonsense? Was he really becoming a Muslim? It seems so. A Muslim, a devout Hindu, all right, I can understand. Christian in addition, it's getting a bit strange, but I can stretch my mind. The Christians have been here for a long time. St. Thomas, St. Francis Xavier, the missionaries, and so on. We owe them good schools. Yes. So all that I can sort out, sort of accept. But Muslim? It's a totally foreign to our tradition. They're outsiders. They've been here a very long time, too. They're a hundred times more numerous than the Christians. That makes no difference. They're outsiders. Perhaps Pasheen is marching in a different drumbeat of progress. You're defending the boy? You don't mind that he's fancying himself a Muslim? What can we do, Sentosh? He's taken to it, taken it to heart, and it's not going any, doing anyone any harm. Maybe it's just a phase. It, too, may pass, like Mrs. Gandhi. Why can't he have a normal interest in a boy of his age? Look at Ravi. All I can think about is cricket and movies and music. You think that's better? No, no. Oh, I don't know what to think. It's been a long day, he sighed. I wonder how far he'll go with these interests, Mother chuckled. Last week, he finished a book called The Imitation of Christ. The Imitation of Christ? I say again, I wonder how far he'll go with these interests, cried Father. They laughed. And basically, this was him overhearing his parents complaining that he has three religions, and apparently his mother gave in to him getting a prayer rug and to be baptized. Yeah. Cool. And so, uh, also, heads up, my videos are only partially monetized now because uh, we're talking about religion, and that means I'm not <coughs> advertiser-friendly mentioning Islam, Muslimhood, and all of that nonsense, which is a tad bit, a tad bit bordering on, like, something that's not okay. Fun fact, uh, being a part of Islam isn't something that should make me not advertiser-friendly, as far as this book is concerned. But okay, whatever. I'll still tag it. I mean, money isn't everything. I'm just saying, like... <laughs> Maybe YouTube needs to get off its high horse. Anyways, chapter 28. I loved my prayer rug. Ordinary in quality though it was, it glowed with beauty in it in my eyes. I'm sorry I lost it. Whatever, Wherever I laid it, I felt special affection for the patch of ground beneath it and immediately around surrounding it which meant to me a clear indication that it was a good prayer rug, because it helped me remember that the earth is a creation of God and sacred in time all over. The pattern, in gold lines upon a background of red, was plain. A narrow rectangle with a triangular peak at one extremity to indicate the Qibla, the direction of prayer. 
The next curlicues floating around it, like wisps of smoke or accents from a strange language. The pile was soft. When I prayed for the short, unknotted tassels were inches from the tip of my forehead at the one end of the carpet and inches from the tip of my toes at the other. A cozy size to make you feel at home anywhere upon this vast earth. I prayed outside because I liked it. Most often I unrolled my prayer rug in a corner of the yard behind the house. It was a scheduled spot in the shade of a coral tree next to the wall that was covered with bergenvia villas, whatever. Along the length of the wall was a row of potted Ancedias, Bougainvillea, had, cre- had cr- also crept through the tree. The contrast between its purple bracts and the red flowers of the tree was very pretty. And when the tree was in bloom, it was a regular aviary of crows, main, minas, babblers, rosy pastures, sunbirds, and parakeets. The wall was to my right in a wide angle. Ahead of me and to my left, beyond the milky, mottled shade of a tree, lay the sun-drenched open space of the yard. The appearance of things changed, of course, depending on the weather. The time of day, the time of year, but it's all very clear in my memory as if it never changed. I faced Mecca with help of the line I scratched into the pale yellow ground and carefully kept up. Sometimes, upon finishing my prayers, I would turn and catch sight of father or mother or Ravi observing me, until they got used to the sight. My baptism was a slightly awkward affair. Mother played along nicely, father looked on stonily, and Ravi was mercifully absent because of cricket match, which did not prevent him from commenting at great lengths on the event. The water trickled down my face and down my neck, though just a beaker's worth. It had the refreshing effect of a monsoon rain. And that's the end of chapter 28. And so he's in this talking about his baptism and how he's using his prayer rug, in which he apparently loses later. Oh, yeah, this is also a book about him being trapped on a boat with a tiger. It's really taking a long time to get to that. Anyways, moving on. Chapter 29. Why do people move? What makes them uproot and leave everything they've known for a great unknown beyond the horizon? Why climb this Mount Everest of formalities that makes you feel like a beggar? Why enter this jungle of foreignness where everything is new, strange, and difficult? The answer is the same the world over. People move in the hope of a better life. The mid-1970s were troubled times in India. I gathered that from the deep froze that appeared on Father's forehead when he read the papers, or from snippets of conversation that I caught between him and mother and Mamaji and others. It's not that I didn't understand the drift of what they said. It's that I wasn't interested. The orangutans were eager for chapatis as ever. The monkeys never asked ever the news of Delhi. The rhinos and goats continued to live in peace. The birds twittered. The clouds carried rain. The sun was hot and the earth breath breathed. God was. There were no emergencies in my world. Mrs. Gandhi finally got the best of father. In February 1976, the Tamil Nadu government was brought down by Delhi. It had been one of Mrs. Gandhi's most vocal critics. The takeover was smoothly enforced. Chief Minister Karanadi's ministry vanished quietly into resignation, or house arrest. And what does the fall of one local government matter when the whole country's constitution has been suspended these last eight months? But it was to father the crowning touch in Mrs. Gandhi's dictatorial takeover of the nation. The camel at the zoo was unfazed, but that straw broke father's back. He shouted, Soon she'll come down to our zoo and tell us that her jails are full and she needs more space. Could we put Desi with the lions? Maraji Desi was the op- opposing politician. No friend of Mrs. Gandhi's. It makes me sad, my father's ceaseless worrying. Mrs. Gandhi could have personally bombed the zoo. It would have been fine with me. If father had been gay about it, I wish he hadn't fretted so much. It's hard on a son to see his father sick with worry. But worry he did. Any business is risky business, and none more than the small bee business, the one that risks the shirt on its back. All zoo is cultural institution. Like a public library, like a museum, it's at the service of popular education and science. And by this token, not much of money-making venture, for the greater good and the greater profit are not compatible aims, much to father's chagrin. The truth was, we were not a rich family, certainly not by Canadian standards. We were a poor family that happened to own a lot of animals, though not the roof above our heads, or above ours for that matter, above their heads or ours for that matter. The life of a zoo, like the life of its inhabitants in the wild, is precarious. It is neither big enough a business to be above the law, nor small enough to survive on its margins. To prosper, a zoo needs parliamentary government, democratic elections, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of association, rule of law, everything else enshrined in India's constitution. Impossible to enjoy the animals otherwise. Long term, bad politics is bad for business. 
People move because of wear and tear of anxiety, because of a gnawing feeling that no matter how hard their work, their efforts will yield nothing. That what they build up in one year will be torn down in one day by others, because of the impression that future is blocked up, that they might do all right, not, but not their children, because of the feeling that nothing will change. That happiness and prosperity are, impo- are possible only somewhere else. The new India split into pieces and collapsed in father's mind. Mother assented. We must bolt. It was announced to us one evening during dinner. Ravi and I were thunderstruck. Canada? If Andhra Pradesh, just north of us, was alien, if Sri Lanka, a monkey's hop across the strait, was the dark side of the moon, imagine what Canada was. Canada meant absolutely nothing to us. It was like Timbuktu, by definition, a place permanently far away. And that is the end of chapter 29. And it turns out that this Mrs. Gandhi is actually a person that I maybe should have known about, but I don't really know much about Indian history, especially in the 1970s. All I know is Britain was there at one point. Anyways, so there's a lot of political strife in the area, and it means the zoo is running out of business, and so they have to leave. They have to move to Canada, and I think finally we're going to move on with our story, which is really, really cool. So, I think we have time for at least one more chapter, if not a couple more. So, let's just keep on rolling through it. Hopefully, you guys are enjoying the story so far. Chapter 30. He's married. I am bent down, taking my shoes off when I hear him say, I would like you to meet my wife. I looked up, and there beside him is Mrs. Patel. Hello, she says, extending her hand and smiling. Machine has been telling me lots about you. I can't say, the, can't say the same of her. I had no idea. She's on her way out, so we take only a few minutes. She's also Indian, but has more typically Canadian accent. She must be second generation. She's a little younger than him, skin slightly darker, long black hair woven in tr- tress, bright dark eyes, and lovely white teeth. She has in her arms a dry-cleaned white lab coat and a protective plastic film. She's a pharmacist. When I say, nice meeting you, Mrs. Patel, she replies, please make it Mina. After a quick kiss between her between husband and wife, she's off work on a working Saturday. This house is more of a box more than a box full of icons. I start noticing small signs of conjugal existence. There they were all along, but I hadn't seen them before because I wasn't looking for them. He's a shy man. Life has taught him not to show off what's most precious to him. Is she the nemesis of digest nemesis of my digestive tract? I've made a special chutney for you, he says. He's smiling. No, he is. And that is the end of chapter 30. That was a very confusing chapter. Basically, we know that Pusheen has a wife later. Kind of it. That's, yep. Anyways, moving on. Chapter 31. <clears throat> they met once. Mr. and Mr. Kumar, the baker and the teacher, the first Mr. Kumar, had expressed the wish to see the zoo. All these years, and I've never seen it. It's so close, too. Will you show it to me? He asked. Yes, of course, I replied. It would be an honor. We agreed to meet at the main gate the next day after school. I worried all that day. I scolded myself. You fool. Why do you always say the main gate? At any time, there will be a crowd of people there. They've forgotten how plain he looks. You'll never recognize him. If I walked by him without seeing him, he would be hurt. He would think I had changed my mind and didn't want to be seen with poor Muslim Baker. He would leave without saying a word. He wouldn't be angry. He would accept my claims that it was the sun in my eyes, but he wouldn't want to come by the zoo anymore. I could see it happening that way. I had to recognize him. I would hide and wait until I was certain it was him. That's what I would do. But I had to notice before it was, and I had to try my hardest to recognize him that I was at least able to pick him out. The very effort seemed blind to me. At the appointed hour, I stood squarely before the main gate of the zoo and started rubbing my eyes with both hands. What are you doing? It was Raj, your friend. I'm busy. You're busy rubbing your eyes? Go away. Let's go to Beach Road. I'm waiting for someone. Well, you'll miss him if you keep rubbing your eyes like that. Thank you for the information. Have fun on Beach Road. How about Government Park? I can't. I tell you. I can't, I tell you. Come on. Please, Raj. Move on. He left. I went back to rubbing my eyes. Will you help me with my math homework, Pie? It was Ajith, my other friend. Later. Go away. Hello, Pasheen. It was Mr. Radhakrishna, a friend of mother's. In a few more words, I eased her on her way. Excuse me, where's Laporte Street? A stranger. That way. How much is admission to the zoo? Another stranger. Five rupees. The ticket booth is right there. You have the chlor- has the chlorine got to your eyes? It was Mamaji. Hello, Mamaji. No, it hasn't. Is your father around? I think so. See you tomorrow morning. 
Yes, Mamaji. I am here, Pasheen. My eyes, my hands froze over my eyes. The voice, strange and familiar, was familiar in a strange way. I felt a smile welling up in me. Salam alaikum, Mr. Kamar. How good to see you. Why alaikum salam. Is something wrong with your eyes? No, nothing. It's just a bit of dust. They look quite red. It's nothing. He headed for the ticket booth, but I called back. No, no, not for you, master. It was with pride that I waved the ticket collector's hand away and showed Mr. Kamar into the zoo. He marveled at everything, at how tall trees came tall giraffes, how carnivores were supplied with herbivores and herbivores with grass, how some creatures crowded the day and others at night, how some that needed sharp beaks had sharp beaks and others that needed limber limbs had limber limbs. It made me happy that he was so impressed. He quoted from the Holy Quran. In all this, there are messages, indeed, for a people who use their reason. We came to the zebras. Mr. Kumar had never heard of such creatures, let alone seen one. He was dumbfounded. They're called zebras, I said. Have they been painted with a brush? No, no. They look like that naturally. What happens when it rains? Nothing. The stripes don't melt? No. I brought some carrots. There is one left, a large and sturdy specimen. I took it out of the bag. At that moment, I heard a slight scraping of gravel to my right. It was Mr. Kumar, coming up the railing with his usual limping and rolling gait. <clears throat> Hello, sir. Hello, Pie. The baker, a shy but dignified man, nodded at the teacher, who nodded back. An alert zebra had noticed my carrot and had come to the low fence. It twitched its ears and stamped the ground softly. I broke the carrot in two and gave one half to Mr. Kumar and one half to Mr. Kumar. Thank you, Pasheen, said one. Thank you, Pie, said the other. Mr. Kumar went first, <laughs> dipping his hand over the fence. The zebra's thick, strong, black lips grasped the tiny carrot eagerly. Mr. Kumar wouldn't let go. The zebra sank its teeth into the carrot and snapped it in two. It crunched loudly on the treat for a few seconds and then reached for the remaining piece, lips following, flowing over Mr. Kumar's fingertips. He released the carrot and touched the zebra's soft nose. It was Mr. Kumar's turn. He wasn't so demanding of the zebra. Once it has left of the carrot between its lips, he let go. Lips hurriedly moved the carrot into its mouth. Mr. and Mr. Kumar looked delighted. A zebra, you say, said Mr. Kumar. That's right, I replied. It belongs to the same family as the ass and the horse. The Rolls Royce of equids, said Mr. Kumar. What a wondrous creature, said Mr. Kumar. This one's a grant zebra, I said. Mr. Kumar said, Ecus brecheli bemi. <laughs> Mr. Kumar said, Alu Akbar. I said, it's very pretty. We looked on. I think I'm going to end it there. Yeah, that's chapter 31 all done there, guys. Um, so what happened in this chapter was basically both Kumars. Um, I don't remember what one of them is. I know the other one's uh, from Islam. The other one, oh, probably the Hindu guy. Yeah, anyways, uh, so both Kumars are in the park, and for some reason, uh, I guess for comedic purposes, he refers to them both as Mr. Kumar. Maybe I'm just not in a mood to be amused. Anyways, that, that, yeah, they just both were in the zoo, and one of them was amazed. Well, I guess they were both amazed by the zebra, and the guy was like, do the stripes melt when it rains? And he was like, no, no, they do not. But, you know, I don't think that's a realistic question. I think almost everyone knows what a zebra is, and if they don't, they know what, like, you know, spots and, sorry, spots and, you know, stripes and things are on animals. Um, tigers have stripes. Everyone knows what a tiger is. So it's an unrealistic question. Anyways, maybe I'm just not feeling this book right now. Anyways, that's the end of chapter 31, okay? Okay, yeah, cool, we're done. Uh, I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you so much for joining me. Somebody yell at YouTube for me because I'm not happy with people uh, giving me partial monetization on my videos just because I'm talking about religion. I'm not actually talking about religion. It's just the book. I have no control over it. Yeah. Anyways, thanks for joining me. Welcome back, I'm Micah Reeves, and today we're going to be continuing with Life of Pi by Jan Martel. We are on chapter 
chapter 32, and I think I'm going to finish up with 36 in this video. So cool. Now you have a good expectation of what's going to happen. There are many examples of animals coming to surprisingly surprising living arrangements. All are instances of that animal equivalent of anthropomorphism, zoomorphism, where an animal takes a human being or an other animal to be one of its kind. The most famous case is also the most common, a pet dog, which has so assimilated humans into the realm of doghood as to want to mate with them. In fact, that any dog owner who wishes to pull an amorous dog from the leg of a mortified visitor will confirm. Our golden agouti and spotted paca got along very well, contentedly hugging together and sleeping against each other until the first was stolen. I've already mentioned our rhinoceros and goat herd, and the case of the circus lions. There are confirmed stories of drowning sailors being pushed up to the surface of the water and held there by dolphins, a characteristic way in which these marine mammals help each other. A case is mentioned in the literature of a stoat and a rat living in a companion relationship, while other rats presented to the stroat, stoat were devoured by it in a typical way of stoats. I don't know what a stoat is. <laughs> We had our own case of the freak suspension of the predator-prey relationship. We had a mouse that lived for several weeks with the vipers, while other mice dropped in the tray and disappeared. Within two days, this little brown Methuselah built itself a nest, stored the grains we give it in various hideaways, and scampered about in plain sight of the snakes. We were amazed. We put up a sign to bring the mouse into the public's attention. It finally met its end in a curious way. A young viper bit it. Was the viper unaware of the mouse's special status? unsocialized to it, perhaps. Whatever the case, the mouse was bitten by a young viper, but devoured, immediately by an adult. If there was a spell, it was broken by the young one. Things returned to normal after that. All mice disappeared down the viper's gullets at the usual rate. In the trade, dogs are sometimes used as foster mothers for lion cubs. Though the cubs grow to become larger than the caregiver and far more dangerous, they never give their mother trouble, and she never loses her placid behavior or her sense of authority over her litter. Signs have to be put up to explain to the public that the dog is not live food left for the lions, just as we had to put up a sign pointing out that rhinoceros are herbivores and do not eat goats. What could be explanation for zoomorphism? Can't a rhinoceros distinguish a big from small, tough hide from soft fur? Isn't it plain to a dolphin what a dolphin is like? I believe the answer lies in something I mentioned earlier, the measure of madness that moves life in strange but saving ways. The golden agouti, like the rhinoceros, was in need of companionship. The circus lions don't care to know that their leader is a weakling human. The fiction guarantees their social well-being and staves off violent anarchy. As for lion cubs, they could positively keel over with fright if they knew their mother was a dog, but that would mean they were motherless, the absolute worst condition imaginable for any young, warm-blooded life. I'm sure even the adult viper, as it swallowed the mouse, must have felt somewhere in its undeveloped mind of a twinge of regret, feeling that something greater was just missed. An imaginative leap away from the lovely, crude reality of a reptile. And that's the end of chapter 32. Yeah, super easy. So basically, this was a talk of how two animals, or, uh, yeah, I guess two animals can live together in kind of harmony, even if they are predator and prey. There are weird circumstances in which this can happen, where they can live together. Just like uh, how there's like a tarantula that has like a little frog that lives with it, and it eats parasites. And the tarantula just lets it live because it protects the spider's eggs. Yeah, that happens in real life. Cool. Yeah, I think this is all relating to how he's going to have to probably live with a tiger on the boat. And uh, how that's going to be a struggle. Chapter 33. <laughs> he shows me family memorabilia. Wedding photos first. Hindu wedding with Canadian Canada prominent on its edges. A younger him, a younger her. They went to Niagara Falls for their honeymoon. Had a lovely time. Smiles to prove it. We moved back in time from his student days at U of T with friends in front of St. Mike's in his room during Durwali on General Street, or Gerard Street, reading at St. Basil's Church dressed in a white gown, wearing another kind of white gown in a lab of zoology department on graduation day. A smile every time, but his eyes tell another story. Photos from Brazil with plenty of three-toed sloths in situ. With the turn of a page, we jump over the Pacific. And there he is, next to nothing. Tells me that the camera did click regularly, on all the usual important occasions, but everything was lost. What little there is consists of what was assembled by Maji and mailed over after the events. There's a photo taken at the zoo during this visit of a VIP. In black and white, another world is revealed to me. The photo is crowded with people. 
The Union cabinet minister is the focus of attention. There's a giraffe in the background. Near the edge of the group, I recognize a younger Mr. Hadiru Basami. Mamaji, I asked, pointing. Yes, he says. There's a man next to the minister with born rim glass or horn rim glasses and hair very cleanly combed. He looks like a plausible Mr. Patel, face rounder than his son's. Is this your father? I asked. He shakes his head. I don't know who that is. There's a pause of a few seconds. He says, It's my father who took the picture. On the same page, there's another group shot mostly of school children. He taps the photo. That's Richard Paca, he says. I'm amazed. I look closely, trying to retract its exact personality from appearance. Unfortunately, it's black and white again, and a little out of focus. A photo taken in better days. Casually, Richard Parker is looking away. He doesn't even realize that his picture is being taken. The opposing page is entirely taken up by a color photo of swimming pool of the Obindu Ashram. It's a nice big outdoor pool with clear sparkling water, a clean, bl clean blue bottom, and an attached diving pool. The next page features a photo of the front gate of Petit Seminaire School, an arch as the school's motto painted on it. Nil magnum, nisabonum, no greatness without goddess. And that's it, an entire childhood memorialized in four neatly irrelevant photographs. He grows som sober, sombra, whatever. The worst of it, he says, is that I can hardly remember that my mother, what my mother looks like anymore. I can see her in my mind, but it's fleeting. As soon as I try and have a good look at her, she fades. It's the same with her voice. If I saw her again in the street, it would all come back, but that's not likely to happen. It's very sad not to remember what your mother looks like. Closes the book. And that's the end of chapter 33. And so, here we uh, see him talking. Here we see him uh, talking to the guy who's, I guess, in his house for some reason, observing him. And he's talking about his childhood. And apparently, uh, all the photos got destroyed. And there's only four pictures from his childhood left. Like, it still shows, like, the rest of his life, um, where he, like, goes to school and he gets married and stuff like that. But everything from his childhood is gone except for four photos. And so the guy interviewing him was like, is that your dad? And he's like, no, my dad took the picture. And so he has no pictures of his father or mother. He has no, like, physical representation of them. So his, mo his the memory of his mother is fading away from him, and he looks sad thinking about it. Yeah. Cool. Anyways, chapter 34. Father said... We'll sail like Columbus. He was hoping to find India, I pointed out sullenly. We sold the zoo, lock, stock, and barrel. To a new country, a new life. Besides assuring our collection of happy future to the transaction would pay for our immigration and leave us with a good sum to make a fresh start in Canada. Though now when I think of it, the sum is laughable. How blinded we are by money. We could have sold our animals to zoos in India, but American zoos were willing to pay higher prices. Sites, the Convention of International Trade and Endangered Species, had just come into effect, and the window on the trading of captured wild animals had slammed shut. The future of zoos would now lie in other zoos. The Pondicherry Zoo closed shop just at the right time. There was a scramble to buy our animals. The final buyers were a number of zoos, mainly the Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago, and the soon-to-open Minnesota Zoo. But odd animals were going to Los Angeles, Louisville, Oklahoma City, and Cincinnati. The two animals that were being shipped to the Canada Zoo, that's how Ravi and I felt. We did not want to go. We did not want to live in a country of gale force winds and minus 200 degree winters. Canada, well, not on the cricket map. Departure was made easier as far as getting as us used to the idea. By the time it took all the pre-departure pre preparations, it took well over a year. I don't mean for us, I mean for the animals. Considering that animals dispense with clothes, footwear, linen, furniture, kitchenware, toiletries, that nationality means nothing to them, that these are not a jot for passports, money, employment prospects, schools, cost of housing, health care, facilities, considering, in short, their lightness of being, it's amazing how hard it is to move them. Moving a zoo is like moving a city. The paperwork was colossal. Liters of water used up in the wedding of stamps. Dear Mr. So-and-so, written a hundred of times, offers made, sighs heard, doubts expressed, haggling on the, gone through, decisions sent, higher up for approval, prices agreed upon, deals clinched, dotted line, signed, congratulations given, certificates of origin sought, certificates of health sought, export permits sought, import permits sought, quarantine regulations clarified, transportation organized, a fortune spent on telephone calls. It's a joke in the zoo business, a weary joke that the paperwork involved in trading a shrew weighs more than the elephant. 
and that the paperwork involved in trading an elephant weighs more than a whale, and that when you never try to trade a whale, never, there seems to be a single file of nitpicking bureaucrats from Pondicherry to Minneapolis, to Minneapolis via Delhi and Washington, each with his form, his problem, his hesitation. Shipping the animals to the moon couldn't possibly have been more complicated. Father pulled nearly every hair off his head and came close to giving up on a number of occasions. There were surprises. Most of our birds and reptiles and lemurs and rhinos, orangutans, mandrills, lion-tailed macaws, <sighs> giraffes, anteaters, tigers, leopards, cheetahs, hyenas, zebras, Himalayan sloth bears, Indian elephants, and Nilgiri tars, among others, were in demand, but others, Elfie, for example, were met with silence. A cataract operation, father shouted, waving the letter. They'll take her if we do a cataract operation on her right eye. On a hippopotamus, what's next? Nose jobs on the rhinos? rhinos? Some of our other animals were considered too common. The lions and baboons, for example. Father judiciously traded these for orangutan with the Miss Mysore Zoo and a chimpanzee from the Manila, Manila Zoo. As for Elfie, she lived out the rest of her days in the Triv Trivandum Zoo. One zoo asked for an authentic Brahmin cow for their children's zoo. Father walked out to the urban jungle of Pondicherry and bought a cow with dark wet eyes, a nice fat hump and horn so straight at right angles to its head, and it looked like it had been lick had licked an electrical outlet. Father had its horns painted bright orange and little plastic bells fitted to the tips for added authenticity. A deputation of three Americans came. I was very curious. I had never really seen live Americans. They were pink, fat, friendly, very competent, and sweated profusely. They examined our animals. They put most of them to sleep and then supplied te stethoscopes to their hearts, examined urine and feces as if horoscopes drew blood in syringes and analyzed it. Fon fondled humps and bumps, tapped teeth, blinded eyes with flashlights, pinched skins, stroked and pulled hairs. Poor animals. They must have thought they were being drafted in the U.S. Army. We got big smiles from the Americans and bone-crushing handshakes. The result was that animals, like us, got their working papers. There, they were future Yankees, and we future can Canucks. <laughs> That's the end of chapter 34. Man, it's getting rough to read, but it looks like I'm about to hit like a... Yeah, about to finish part one. Thank God. All right, we're almost there. Yeah, so in this chapter, uh, they were selling all the animals at their zoo, and he spent way too much time explaining what animals and paperwork and stuff, and I don't care. I hate all of the lists he does. I, I almost... When I read books that have this many lists in it, I always skip the list just completely. Like, I don't care the animals, I don't care about it, but since I'm reading you guys, I'm gonna read it, but it's killing my soul. Anyway, chapter 35. We left Madras on June 21st, 1977, on the Panamer Panamanian registered Japanese cargo ship, Simsum. Her, her officers were Japanese, her crew was Taiwanese, and she was large and impressive. On our last day in Pondicherry, I said goodbye to Mamaji, to Mr. and Mr. Kumar, to all my friends, and even to many strangers. Mother was a parent on her finest sari. Her long trees, artfully folded back and attached to the back of her head, was adorned with a garland of fresh jasmine flowers. She looked beautiful and sad, for she was living India, India of the heat and monsoons, of rice fields and of Kaveri River, of coastlines and stone temples, of bullock carts and colorful trucks of friends and known shopkeepers of Nehru Street and Gobert Sali of this and that India so familiar to her and loved by her while her men I fancy myself one already I thought I was only 16 we're in a hurry of getting to go we're Winnipeggers at heart and already and she lingered oh this is really difficult to I think the way I said that was awful but basically they were ready to go, and she was still lingering on India. Anyways, the day before our departure, she pointed a cigarette at Walla and uh, earnestly asked, Should we get a pack or two? Father replied, They have tobacco in Canada. And why do you want to buy a cigarette? We don't smoke. Yes, they have tobacco in Canada, but do they have gold flake cigarettes? Do they own Arun ice cream? Are the bicycles heroes? All their television onitas? Are the cars ambassadors? Are the bookshops Higginbotham's? Such, I suspect, were the questions that swirled in Mother's mind as she contemplated buying cigarettes. Animals were sedated, cages were loaded and secured, feed was stored, bunks were assigned, lines were tossed, and whistles were blown. As the ship was worked out of the dock and piloted out to sea, I wildly waved goodbye to India. The sun was shining, the breeze was steady, and seagulls shrieked in the air above us. I was terribly excited. Things didn't turn out the way they were supposed to, but what can you do? You must take life the way it comes at you and make the best of it.
And so finally, they have left India. Uh, his mother was kind of hanging on to India a little bit, but they were like, it's time to go. Time to move on with our lives. We are, we are now Canadians. And so they were on their way with all the animals in tow. And so he's just waving goodbye to India. It's gone forever. All right. Chapter 36, the final chapter in our reading. <clears throat> the cities are large and memorably crowded in India. When you leave, you seem to travel through vast stretches of country where hardly a soul is to be seen. I remember wandering where 950 million Indians could be hiding. I could say the same of his house. A little early, I've just set foot, foot on the cement steps of the front porch when a teenager, teenager bursts out the front door. He's wearing a baseball uniform and carrying baseball equipment, and he's in a hurry. When he sees me, he stops dead in his tracks, startled. He turns around and hollers into the house. Dad, the writer's here, to me, he says. Hi, and rushes off. His father comes to the front door. Hello, he says. That was your son, I asked, incredulous. Yes, to acknowledge the fact brings a smile to his lips. I'm sorry you didn't meet properly. He's late for practice. His name is Nikhil. He goes by Nick. I'm in the entrance hall. I didn't know you had a son, I say. There's a barking. A small mongrel mutt, black and brown, races up to me, panting and sniffing. He jumps up against my legs. Or a dog, I add. He's friendly. Tata down. Tata ignores him. I hear, hello. Only this greeting is not short and forceful like Nicky's. It's a long, nasal, and softly whining, hello, with the O reaching for like a tap on a shoulder or a gentle tug at my pants. I turn, leaning against the sofa in the living room. Looking up at me bashfully is a little brown girl, pretty and pink, very much at home. She's holding an orange cat in her arms. Two front legs sticking straight up and a deeply sunk head are all that's visible of it above her crossed arms. The rest of the cat is hanging all the way down to the floor. The animal seems quite relaxed about being stretched on the rack in this manner. And this is your daughter, I say. Yes, Usha. Usha, darling. Are you sure Moccasin is comfortable? Like that. Usha drops Moccasin. He flips on the floor unperturbed. Hello, Usha, I say. She comes up to her father and peeks at me from behind his leg. What are you doing, little one? He says. Why are you hiding? She doesn't reply, only looks at me with a smile and hides her face. How old are you, Usha? I ask. She doesn't reply. Then, Rasheen Molotar Patel, known to all to Pai Patel, bends down and picks up his daughter. You know the answer to that question, hmm? You're four years old. One, two, three, four. At each number, he softly presses the tip of her nose with his index finger. She finds this terribly funny. She giggles and buries her face in the crook of his neck. The story has a happy ending. So that's the end of part one. So, well, let's finish up what happened in this chapter and then we'll get the whole part one done. So, um, it turns out that it's giving us like a heads up that, hey, there's probably a catastrophe coming. Um, but this is definitely Pi Patel. He definitely lives. He has a kid. He has two kids and he has a cat and a dog and his life is good and he lives in India now. And so it's like a full like summary of like, hey, that's about to happen, but, like, you know, it's going to end okay, so, like, kind of hang in there and, like, don't worry too much, because we got your back. And so, now we can do the full part one summary. And so, what happened in this whole part one area? So, this was just an introduction to Pi. Turns out that he has multiple religions. He's a kid, um, going through life. He didn't like his name, Pasheen, because it was too close to pissing, <laughs> and people made fun of him. So, he went to a new school, and he changed his name to Pi. And he made a big deal of it, and everybody's like, okay, you're Pi. And so he's he goes by Pi. And so uh, as he moves along in his childhood, he discovers that religion kind of calls to him. And so he picks up multiple religions. He picks up Hinduism. He picks up uh, being a part of Islam, I guess being a Muslim. And he picks up Christianity. And so he picks up three religions, which he devoutly follows. And he's like, I like these religions a lot. They all have different aspects that really appeal to me. And then he goes to his... um. Oh yeah, his mother, and he's like, his mother and father, and he's like, I want a prayer rug, and I want to be baptized, I want to be a part of, like, these religions fully, I want to really be engaged with them, and his parents are like, uh, yeah, I guess, is the bottom line, and so he joins those religions, and he is officially part of those religions, and his family, in the 70s, uh, India's going through, like, a weird rocky time, so his family's like, well, it's not good for zoos, because he lives in a zoo, uh, so we're gonna have to get out of here, we're gonna have to move, and so they sell all their animals for the zoo, and they're like, we're going to Canada. And so they they get ready to go to Canada. And throughout all this, we're getting, like, flashes to the future where we see that 
Pi is alive, but we're not necessarily aware that Pi is alive because they're not really just telling who the person is that they're describing or what the purpose of this is. They're just intermittently throwing chapters in there of the future. Until finally, he says his, in the final chapter here, he says his full name out and he's like, this is Vishen Patel. He has a daughter, he has a son, he has a dog, he has a cat, and he has a wife, and he's in India now, again. So despite him going to Canada at his childhood and something bad happening that we don't know about yet, things turn out well. And that's that's everything. That's the whole book up to that point. So, um, thank you guys uh, for joining me through part one. I think we're I think we're happy with how that went. I'll see you guys in the next part, in the next chapter, I guess. Um, goodbye. <laughs>